riding through the heart of France where chateaus complement the landscape and equestrian is serious business. Stage four of the Tour de France is sure to be a picturesque one. Hello and welcome, this is Matthew Keenan with you on a day which is poised to be one for the sprinters and we ask the question, will it be Cavendish again, perhaps Sagan, Breipel lining up for his first this year and there's a whole host of others hoping to join them as stage winners in 2016. Sumer is where the stage starts and eventually we make it down to Limoges and it's the longest stage of this year's race, 237.5 kilometres. There are not a lot of obstacles early, it's relatively flat, but it gets a fraction more bumpy towards the finish. The Category 4 climb isn't monstrous, but the rise in altitude will just take a bit of the sting out of the tail of the sprinters. But it's sure to be one for the fast men. With this being such a long stage, the flag went down for the neutral depart at 10 past 11 local time. They then had 10 kilometres in the neutral zone to add to the already 237 kilometres. So a long day in the saddle. Almost 250 kilometres worth of riding. They get those first 10 for free. Although they do take a little bit of energy out of the legs. Everybody, the riders included, hoping for a slightly more aggressive stage than what we saw yesterday. But it's perfectly understandable that they can't go full noise all day, every day. This is the situation of the race with a breakaway group of four. This is Andreas Schillinger from Bora Argon 18. We've seen them so often represented in the breakaways, particularly the first two stages where they had two riders each day in the break. And a brief stint for Paul Voss in the King of the Mountains jersey. Room, just comfortably drifting back towards the team car. He looks so calm. Sunscreen lotion for Chris Froome. It's the first time we've seen that in this year's Tour de France. That's always a good sign. Clearly not the scun sunscreen lotion that he wants. It's all good. He's going to go back to the peloton. They'll call through to the second of the team cars, find exactly what Froome needs, and then I'm sure they'll provide it to him. Marcus Burkhardt is the rider in the red colours from BMC that drifts back to the peloton along with Froome. They have been flawless so far, Team Sky. So too, Movistar, we can say the same of them. Nato Quintana, Chris Froome, they haven't been put in the position where they've even looked like they've been threatening to lose a bit of time. Of the contenders for a top five finish, we've seen a mechanical problem, a rear wheel puncher for Richie Port. That's cost him some time. Richie Port finds himself at a minute and 59 seconds down. So he's 1 minute and 45 seconds behind Chris Froome. And Alberto Contador, it's been well documented. He's had those two crashes. And Contador's conceded some time. He's at a, a minute and two seconds behind the yellow jersey. This is Ian Stannard getting changed. It is warming up. It looks as if the former British national champion has taken his undershirt off. Luke Rowe is the rider that he is alongside. And just behind them, in the white colours of Dimension Data, is Bernard Eisel. Who had a brilliant day yesterday, the Austrian. Dimension Data coming to the front today to assist with the chasing, aiming for stage winner number 29 in the career of Mark Cavendish. This is the breakaway group. Schillinger, we've already mentioned. He's the rider at the back with the uh, red helmet on. And this is a part of the course where they can ditch some of their wrappings. You just saw that red sign as they entered into this small town of Pazay le -Cy. It indicates that this is an area, and that's the close of it. You can see those two red bollards on either side of the road. That's the close of where they can dump their rubbish. 
Got to get it out if you're going to get it out. Too late. Now you have to either carry it to the finish line or put it in the team car. And there is one more of these spots where they can do that. About to head into the feed zone. At the back of the group, this is Olivia Neeson for IM Cycling. They were the first team to break away this year, courtesy of Lee Howard. Miguel Irazar is in the break for Trek Segafredo. And for the French, they've managed to get one of the riders from AG to Al Le Mondial into the team. And it's a first timer at the Tour de France. Alexi Gougere has made it into today's breakaway. And he is an exciting rider for the future. As we take a look. All smiles for now, but I just know that behind that smile of Andre Greipel, he'll be seething about yesterday. He's being beaten by such a a small margin but on top of that I think you'll feel just ever so slightly embarrassed about claiming it with the fist pump after the line and then seeing the photo and getting the news that he hadn't actually won he want to make amends as quickly as possible and just wipe that all away four stage wins in this race last year for Greipel his best Tour de France today he's had 10 stage wins in total in the Tour de France that hurt him yesterday It'll be a tense finish this afternoon, and it's a perfectly straight approach for the last 1,500 metres. The last 500 metres are uphill, not super steep, not climbers uphill, but tough for the sprinters uphill. I think it's going to favour Peter Sagan. Yesterday was one of those days that just seemed to go on forever, and you heard from Thomas Vockler earlier on saying that he was bored, he thought the spectators were bored, and that was the part of the reason that he went on the attack. Well, Edward Toynes... The young Belgian from the Trek Segafredo team, who finished fifth yesterday, was riding his first Tour de France. He said it was the slowest race he's ever ridden. Raphael Maika, Polish national champion, with those bright reddish shoes on, it's going to make it easy to spot him throughout the rest of the season. And there's Lars back in the red colours. Natnet Bihan is the rider in the white colours of Dimension Data. Three kilometres to the intermediate sprint. I'm not expecting to see a battle between these four out in front. It is Nason in the white and colours with the red and the blue nicks. Schellinger going to the front now in the black colours of Bora Argon 18. In the black and white colours of Trek Segafredo, that is Iriza. And Goujard, the young Frenchman, who was very impressive at the start of the season. He was impressive last year as well. And he's going to win a lot of races in his career. Well, I've just been looking up his palmarès, Matt, and Goujard last season won five races. His most impressive ride that I saw this year was in the opening weekend of racing in Belgium at the Umlut Het News Blad. He was in the day-long breakaway, and then they were caught by a really strong group that included Peter Sagan, and he stayed with them, and he kept working, and he finished in fifth position, whilst everybody else that was originally in that breakaway got dropped. And he didn't just sit on and say, hey, I've been in the move all day, I'm a passenger. He just kept charging on through. Yeah, he kept working all the way through to the finish. It was an incredibly strong ride. So, I said before, maybe Nason was the one to watch, but after looking more at the others, Palmares, what they've done this season, my money would be swinging across to Alexis Guzard. I'll be joining Mike. One kilometre to the intermediate sprint as they enter the department of the Hutbian. Well, that's the department that they've been in for the majority of today's stage. The sprint for the minor placings back in the main peloton so far has been a contest as to who can get there first and spend the least amount of energy. Is there a conversation that's about to happen to share the points through here? Well, there's no sharing because there's only one sprint. They'll all get points, but there's only one prize as such. About a thousand euro, I believe it is, for the winner of the intermediate sprint. Unless it goes down the first three, better check out the prize book, Matt, and go through the finer details. But it's more about the prestige of who wins the intermediate sprint. It's a little bit of a talking point. Always interesting for the, the sponsors. They'd like to see their rider cross the line first, something to brag about a little bit. Like I said before, these riders may be thinking, 
the chances are very slim we'll get to the finish so we'd like to get something here something to take back to the team as it were and say well I got out there and I won the intermediate sprint less than 500 meters to go still working well together just going going around swapping turns at the front 300 meters until the sprint here nobody looking like they're sort of sizing the others up just yet so will they just keep working smoothly was someone going to make that jump Schellinger goes to the front he's got that little look underneath the arms and now he wants to sprint he's a former track cyclist so he wants to make sure he gets the points the other three they're not interested so it's Andreas Schellinger who collects and Olivia Nason waves goodbye we'll see you soon Schellinger picking up the 20 points in the race for the green jersey it was then that Nason followed by Idiza and Gujar at the back of the group. The youngest rider in the break, the least interested in the small prizes because Alexi likes big prizes. <laughs> one kilometre before they get to the top of this climb. I'm going to let that one slide about the cow and the butcher. It was 40 euro a kilo. You could have held on to it. The uh, Côte de la Maison Neuve is the climb that they now find themselves on. It's not a particularly big climb, as you can see. There's only one point up for grabs in the King of the Mountains classification. Jesper Sturven wears the polka dot jersey as the leader of that competition. He's on four points, so he can't lose the lead today, but he will be challenged for that lead tomorrow. So I think we might see Jesper Sturven getting the breakaway tomorrow. He's a smart bike rider, Jesper. Just 24 years old in his first Tour de France, and he's having a big impact. A beautiful rolling countryside. It's a fantastic place to ride a bike. The high mountains of the Pyrenees and the Alps is where most people like to go because there's a great sense of accomplishment just getting to the top of those famous coals. But here it's slightly more pleasant. It's a little easier, the riding side of things. Let's you enjoy the local food and wine of the region a little bit more. Welsh flags on the side of the road. They've had a lot to cheer about over the past couple of weeks, particularly with Euro 16 underway and the Welsh team playing so well. Two Welsh riders in the race, both riding with Team Sky, Luke Rowe and Geraint Thomas. They've both been involved in falls on stage one, but neither of them seriously injured. So things looking good in their support role for Chris Froome. Nina Nason at the front. Then Idiza, followed by Schillinger, and then it's Gujar at the back. Well, the time gap just staying stable around that two minute mark it's what the sprinters teams in the peloton will want just to hold it even until they decide it's time to ramp things up and they'll be looking to bring this group back in only in the last 20 kilometers probably even later than that because there's an, an uncategorized climate about 11 kilometers to go it's one and a half kilometers long and it's about nine percent so it's not a, a huge hill by any stretch but the sprinters teams won't want to be providing a springboard to any riders to go on the attack and it's always a little bit off-putting for riders in the peloton to go on the attack when there's still a breakaway in front. Neeson at the front, nobody appearing to challenge in him. Schellinger collected the intermediate sprint. Irizar looks as if he's keen to collect the point because his teammate leads the classification and that's exactly what he does. Mark Al Irizar across the top in first position. One point in the race for the King of the Mountains jersey. And once again at the back of the group, Robbie, Alexi Gujar, the youngest guy, not playing any games. Nope, just doing his thing in the break, just doing his turns, uninterested in the prizes because he's not out after the, the King of the Mountains jersey. He's not trying to collect sprint points. So just sitting tight, doing his work, hoping that the bunch goes and makes a mistake. He's not wasting any energy. Adam Yates, winner of the Tour of Turkey back in 2013, when he was a member of the Direct Energy team, it was Europe Car sponsored then, which part of the Vendée U system, which we just saw that little story on. So through that system, support there and onto their professional team, and now he's riding with Dimension Data, and he's in the Tour de France. He was also 18th in the recent Tour de Swiss, so he comes here with some very good form. Well, this is the Buddhist Retreat and Study Centre. And the land that it occupies, they've got some 30 hectares, so it's pretty big. They've got three large temples and three statues of Buddha. Accommodation for monks, there's plenty of ponds with lotus flowers growing in the summer. 
It was established back in 1986 and the centre was built as a result of worldwide donations. So some peace and tranquility. We won't see that in the last couple of kilometres. There's no peace and tranquility when you're sprinting for a stage win at the Tour de France, Robbie. Sorry, Matt, I was just drifted away a little bit then. I was just so calm looking at those pictures. Of course um, you were. Nice to get a chance to be able to take a look at it and try and move into a relaxed mode. And the peloton is still fairly relaxed. There's another one of the statues of Buddha in the centre of this temple, this retreat and study centre. And there's quite a few Buddhist temples throughout France, a few of them in Paris as well. A message of peace. And can't we use that at the moment? Indeed. Well, there might not be too much peace across at Team Katusha because Alexander Kristoff, who was 11th yesterday, he said, I should have done better. And his team sports director, Torsten Schmidt, agrees with him. And he said, today we'll try again. The pressure is on Kristoff's shoulders. The expectations are high. Nothing. Well, he's the birthday boy too. Nothing like putting some pressure on your team leader. Well, if you're the team leader and you're getting paid accordingly, the team can expect performances and if you say yourself I should have done better and it's an honest appraisal then the team really should be able to go along with that and say yes you should have done better keep the pressure on the rider because he'll have plenty more on himself and he'll be really disappointed with his efforts so far Alexander Kristoff but this is a stage finish that suits him Kristoff a real mix of sprinter and classics rider. We've seen him win the Tour of Flanders. We've seen him win Tour de France stages a couple of years ago. And this is a finish. 500 metres at 5%, really dragging, really heavy. It's one that does suit the classics type fast men. So I have expected Christophe to be up there today. Just not sh quite sure he's got the form to take it to the likes of Greipel, Cav, Kittel, Sagan. And even at this moment, Brian Cocard, who had a good third place yesterday. And he'll find a finish to his liking today as well. So they're getting on with the job in hand. They're just inside 40 kilometres to go. Can't see them staying away. Christoph Agnoluto did it back in the year 2000 in racing into Limoges. But the weather was not very nice. Heavy rain and the peloton were huddled together for warmth. Yeah, I think uh, as Jens Voigt uh, mentioned to us, it really was a dramatic day uh, when Anja Luto won. That was a long uh, time ago, and I think everybody kind of went to sleep because of the weather conditions. Uh, here it's slightly different. These guys have never been given their advantage, and uh, what has happened though, they've ridden steadily over the first uh, four or five hours of this race, and now all of a sudden they've also picked up their tempo, because when we get the access to some of the dimension data that's been thrown at us, these guys are riding at uh, 55 to 60 mm. kilometres now. Talk about throwing down the gauntlet to the teams of the sprinters. Oh, look at the face on Irizar here at the back in that white Trek Segafredo jersey. Experience in the breakaway because uh, Irizar has got five tours under those wheels and uh, Andreas Schillinger, the German, has got three. The other two, Gouguer and Nason, are in their first Tour de France and they must be wondering what's hit them, I think, but they've not been afraid to go out and have a little dig today. We're now looking at the lake here of the Vernier. This is really lovely countryside now. Of course, it's the home of the famous Raymond Poulidor. He was on the race. He was 80 in April. And he never wore the yellow jersey in the Tour de France. And for that very reason alone, because he was on the podium more times than anyone else. Oh, bit of a problem oh, there. It looks as though we've got a little cracker from uh, Guga here. Dropping back. And so Raymond Poulidor throughout his career well forget about throughout his career and nowadays Phil though <laughs> when his car drives through the uh, villages yep. you can still hear people shouting Ale Poupou Ale Poupou yes. and Poupou was the nickname, the nickname for the famous uh, Raymond Poulidor my image goes back into the 70s when he was still riding the tour as a star he used to walk into the area by himself without his bike he'd sit down on any park bench and he'd peel a grapefruit and the old elder people that knew him so well I saw an old lady dressed in black reaching across the rails just wanting to touch Raymond Puglia she's going poo 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 touche touche it, it's such a, a popular man well I'll tell you another funny
funny story about uh, Raymond Poulidor because in fact he's an Auvergnat and they say that the Auvergnat region of France is where people are very very careful with their money and uh, Raymond Poulidor when he used to pay for his uh, fuel at the gas <laughs> station he would only write it for 50 francs and people never cashed the cheque because they wanted his signature Anyway, now he's still as famous today as he was uh, all those uh, years ago when he was the great rival to Jacques Anquetil and what a rival that was. Uh, now we're down to three leaders now, Guguerre. Well, he was the youngest rider in the breakaway group at just 24 years of age and we're now down to three. On the front it's uh, Schillinger, followed by Iriza, then in the third, well it's in fact it's Schillinger at the back, sorry. For the front is uh, Nason, the, the Belgian rider, participating in his first Tour de France. And now uh, just uh, dropping onto the front is Markel Iriza, the rider from uh, the Basque Country, uh, riding for the Trek Segafredo squad. This is one of the far extremities uh, of uh, the, the, the lake we were talking about before, that this is the small uh, lake of uh, Royeras. As I mentioned just a little earlier, there's uh, uh, a huge re reservoir of water in this area in the Limousin, including that great lake, the Lac Limousin. But there was also um, a lot of resistance in this part of the war as well. In 1944, uh, the uh, soldiers of the SS uh, rounded up around about 3,000 men in this area. And uh, it really was uh, the heart of the French resistance. So they did this yesterday they were the strong team they didn't get it quite right at the finish we'll see what happens this time little flick of the elbow time for Vermont to come through and take up the pacemaking 18 seconds slipped away just a little bit here there's Aston on the left Movistar in the middle of course they're the team of Quintana uh, but this sort of finish somebody like Alejandro Valverde could deliver a sprint blow very strong on these types of finish up to the line they hit the bottom of the climb about 500 meters out yeah but look over to the right hand side uh, the red and white jerseys Lotto Sudala they've still got a full complement of their leader and poor old Thomas Vokler that's him bobbing about at the back there got the red number 179 the most aggressive rider of yesterday a little bit of discussion about that but his job is done he's just going to cruise in at the back end of the main field in the white jersey just hovering around in the middle of that uh, fork at the front is uh, our man Andre Greipel so the team are now sorting out the sprinters uh, uh, Katusha it seems to me today Katusha are going to give it another go uh, for Alexander Kristoff they feel as though he may have sorted out all of his problems driven on the trouble is you're born in the month of July and you're a world-class cyclist you never get to celebrate with your family and your your children uh, because you're usually on the Tour de France it used to happen on an annual basis to Miguel Ingerain who won the Tour de France five times straight well another town that loves the Tour the Le Puy to somewhere I missed it actually <laughs> La Puy Neige well Merci. it's certainly not uh, <laughs> snowing today uh, Thomas Vogler no job done today. at the back of the group but he has laid down the foundations uh, for his team at uh, Direct Energy to come to the front later on and I think what's important so far is Phil uh, none of the teams that have got these lead out trains have burned out their lead out train they're still pretty much in full complement so as we get closer to the finish and what's interesting about the fact that once we turned uh, around uh, to the right a little bit uh, late about five kilometers ago we started to pick up uh, mainly a tailwind so it's going to be a very very fast approach to the finish line here in Liège in, uh, in Limoges well, I hope we're not in Liège that's a different country never mind a different town but even so we're under 10 kilometers to go now as in, uh, the leader here is Irazar just for the moment all three still try to help one another the common enemy is about to pass under 10 kilometers to go as well just over six miles remember and it's Astana taking a real part in the finish today the man for the future the long term is Aru but uh, Vincenzo Nibali is here Nibali when he won the tour a couple of years ago got off to a great start on the second day when he won an uphill climb in the city of Sheffield in the UK if he produces that form then there'll be no sprinters with him oh now watch out dodgy little corner watch. here as we start to get closer to the outskirts of Limoges the breakaway group is around there nice and safely but look at the 
the smoothness that the main field are negotiating these corners now. These are the moments when you've got to stay at the front end of the peloton. If you dream about touching your brakes at a moment like this, you'll slip back 15, 20 places in the main field, and then you'll have to use a fair amount of energy to move back up towards the front end of the peloton, and it's those little bits of acceleration that uh, deaden your sprint towards the end. Cavendish, he's hovering around there in the green jersey and never far away from him. He's so happy with direction data because he's got his lead-out train, his dream lead-out train back together. Bernie Eisel from Austria, he's got Mark Renshaw, and then of course himself. And over the years, Mark Renshaw, the Australian, has been so instrumental in all of these victories that Mark Cavendish has racked up. Racing to the town here of Le Palais sur Vienne. As we're inside 10 kilometers now to the finishing line, looks as the Lotto boys were looking around to make sure they hadn't got rid of their leader there, Andre Greipel, but he was tucked right in. And Cavendish paying a lot of attention, making space for himself now. These next few kilometers are the hazardous moments for the sprinters in the Tour de France. They've got to be very careful now, Phil, as we start to uh, look at that 10 kilometer to go banner because uh, inside of the last 10 kilometers, and it's one of those things there uh, when you look at the, the race route like this, there's, there's a, a non-categorized little uh, climb towards the finish. It, it only goes up four or 500 meters, but sometimes it can catch the sprinters unawares, and they know how important it is at this stage of the game now to hold their position in the line. Well, look, racing about three miles an hour quicker, the peloton, so they should be shutting this down any minute now as we cross over the Vienne again here. The gap is down just seven seconds. It's rather like uh, counting for takeoff now as these boys close in. Katusha are willing to work. It means they've got faith in Christoph. It's goodbye now to Irizar's dropped off on the right. I think it was. No, it's not. It is uh, Schillinger who's dropped off. Uh, this uh, is Nason on the front, followed by Irizar. Yeah, well, I'm sorry about that, Phil, but that really is prolonging the agony. This is the little incline I was telling you about, and as a sprinter, you've just got to hold on here, hold on to the position. You'll concentrate on the wheel of your lead-out man in front of you and hope that you go over the top of this climb without losing too many positions in the line. That is Irizar there in second position all over his machine. If they look back now, they could probably see the breath of the men in the main field, and now all of a sudden... It's Lotto Sudal have said, OK, now's the time to take control. And you see this little incline, the damage oh, it's yes. doing at the back. And it's Adam Hansen, the Queenslander, that's his job to start the ball rolling for the Lotto boys. There he is on the right of our picture, checking who's coming alongside him. And it looks to me as though Orica have got a keen interest here now for Michael Matthews as well. Not surprised by that. Contador is dancing over on the far left in that orange or a yellowish uh, jersey there. These are the two leaders. We're coming together and we're coming together with about uh, seven kilometers to go. Well, the overall contenders now are mixing it up with the sprinters. You've got the black and blue jerseys on the right-hand side. That's the riders of Team Sky looking after Froome. The AG2R rider in there, Roman Bardet, he's quite happy to be hovering around there you know he Roman Bardet and Warren Bargui the two young Frenchmen they've been very attentive over these early stages they've been finishing in the top 15 I think maybe a little bit of youthful enthusiasm but still they're paying attention and not losing any time now let's take a look at it on the right is team Sky they're looking after Froome trying to keep him safe on the left of the picture we've got Contador's team with the yellow jersey of Sagan right in our picture now in the centre he wants to win while they're trying to keep Contador safe as well the Movisar team dead centre dark blue are looking after Nero Quintana trying to keep him clean as well as we've just slipped to the back this is Irizar now straight through and out oh, talk about bad luck Phil they've been in the breakaway and he's actually now got himself a flat tyre with six kilometres to go that is unlucky that's very unlucky because he'll cost time, not that he's too worried about time. Limoges loves Le Tour. We know that. This is the 15th time we have been here. We've had the Grand Depart here on at least once occasion. There is the flat tyre. Another $120 down the pan. Six kilometres to go. The teams are organised. There's a mixture once again of teams for the overall, wanting to stay out of trouble, teams of the sprinters wanting to get in there, mix it and win the day.
Marcel Seberg trying to pull for Lotto Sudal as they race down before they kick up towards the finish. We're still two kilometers to go. Seberg playing his part now. Hansen's done his and dropped away as they try to leave the last man standing in white, Andre Greipel. This is Marcel Seberg now on the front. He knocks in at around about six foot six. He's a big, powerful man, looks over his shoulder. They really have got it lined up. Fourth position there in that line of riders is Andre Greipel. He's up now up into third position. Seberg has now uh, done his bit. He's gone off a Sagan. He's such a perfect rider when he comes to position. He's in the leader's yellow jersey. If he were to win, of course, he would get a time bonus and increase his overall lead going into tomorrow. That's not his main aim. His main aim is to win the stage today. They made that road look flat. Well, they certainly did. Uh, everybody else are coming in. They'll be given all of the same time. So the men trying to win this race overall, they will finish at the peloton. You've got uh, oh, a couple well, of Right, let's sprint. have a look at this one more time. Brian Cocker, the slightly built Frenchman, uh, putting his shoulder there up against the bigger man on the left-hand side, and it's that throw to the line. Well, well from know. this angle, you cannot see a difference between the two of them. Let's have a look from the uh, helicopter. Well, I just don't know. It's shades of déjà vu from yesterday. Cocker coming on the left here, and Kittle obviously fading a little bit. Sagan and Christophe out of it. Cocker, the little Frenchman, coming up close. Where? is the line Kittles wishing it had come right now a clash of shoulders that's just effort oh dear oh. I still don't know no you we he tried let, let's try this one oh. well, you know well, it's the black line under the wheel that counts not and I still don't know well, you know, the fact of the matter is Brian Cocker is a tracker sprinter. They're, They've well, given it to Kittle. It's unofficial. It says that Provisoire unofficially for Kittle at the moment, but we have to go. I think, Phil, we're going to have to have a very oh long look there yep. at the photo finish. I think we'll probably get 75 reruns here. Yeah. Well, he thinks he's won. Yeah, he does. I'm not convinced. Marcel Kittel, eight times a stage winner, is it nine? We have another go, see if we can work it out this time. Cockhart was coming from a long way down, this hill suited him. Kept his effort right until the end. So difficult to see. It is where the black line goes under the wheel. And we can't see the wheel, never mind the black line. <laughs> well, it is desperately close. It might be shaded by... Uh, Mar oh, it, well, look at that. That, that uh, is official. And there it is. It is as close as it was yesterday. The Frenchman was third yesterday, and he's second today. Yes, yeah. congrats, man. Congrats, congrats. Yeah. Marcel Kittel is back, suffering from depression. He's back, he's back on top, and he's now just won his ninth stage of a Tour de France. But what a battle, though, Phil, and it's, it's that lunge for the line and there is only centimeters less than an inch I would say at the end of the day well there you have it there's confirmation of the result it went to the photo Marcel Kittel just getting ahead of the young Frenchman Brian Cocker and always present getting himself another time bonus by the way Peter Sagan in third place uh, Dylan Groenewegen uh, the Dutch national champion in fourth Alexander Christoph is getting up there hey and look at that in seventh place uh, Dan McClay is making his third appearance in the top ten and Cavendish are fading a little bit down towards the end in eighth place but uh, don't complain he's already won uh, two stages so far out of four other riders uh, tailed off uh, on the uh, right hand side there and that is uh, Thomas de Gent 
Looks like Raoult pulls in the middle for uh, Team Sky. But with these riders, not too concerned. He waited a while. He, he thought he got the... You know, as a sprinter, you, you've got that sense when you, you think you've got the win, but that was so close. He really did have to wait until the photo finish. But just watch from how far back uh, the Frenchman uh, goes in the black jersey there, and uh, he disappears out of the shot. He's on the wheel there of uh, Peter Sagan. Then all of a sudden he's biding in time, we're waiting, he's locked into the slipstream, now the acceleration, now the catapult on the left, and he's slowly, slowly making his way up towards uh, what he hopes is going to be a victory, and on the line, the, the lunge, it's all down to that last moment there, and it was close, huh? Maybe it was the slightly longer arms that gave the victory to Marcel Kittel, because it was all about that throw to the line. That's Krunewegen on the right-hand side in the red, white and blue. And uh, Cavendish over on the left-hand side. We get a chance here to have a look, quick look down there on the magnificent backdrop of the Cathedral of Saint-Étienne. Gothic architecture, uh, construction beginning back in 1273. One Well, there we are, the confirmation of uh, the points competition. Peter Sagan has now taken the lead back off Mark Cavendish in the points competition. And Cavendish drops to second place. Kittle is into third. And Greipel into fourth there. It was uh, not a good finish for Andre up that climb, indeed. No change in the King of the Mountains. It really didn't make any difference. Uh, Jesper Sivan keeps his lead, but it's much more hilly tomorrow. That's the big thing. This has been some of the best spinning I think we've seen in the Tour de France and I was I really I couldn't stand to look at the screen in those last two kilometers it looked so dangerous it was very dangerous uh, very fast and uh, at the end of the day as we mentioned Phil it was a question of biding your time at waiting for the last moment uh, great chance here to look by the way this is the uh, Limoges Benedictine uh, railway station and that's uh, one of the major historical monuments of this region back into uh, 1975 it was uh, damaged during the Second World War, it was bombed by Italian planes in 1940. But today, forget about all of that history. Uh, think about that great win by Marcel Kittel. And of course, I've got to say, I'm, I'm waiting now to see Brian Coquart from France get a sprint victory because that was very, very close. After four stages for the sprinters where avoiding crashes was the objective of the yellow jersey favourites, today the race meets its first serious climbs. Hello and welcome to stage five of the Tour de France. This is Matthew Keenan with you. And it's the city of Limoges where Marcel Kittel won yesterday that hosts the start of today's stage as we head down towards the Cantal. Another long stage as the race enters its first serious climbs. As they bid farewell to Limoges and make their way to La Lorraine, it's a 216 kilometer torture test with the category 4 climb early and then it is littered with climbs towards the end and the first of our category 2 climbs it's not a mountaintop finish but it's not far off it it was a day of celebration yesterday in Limoges for Marcel Kittel this afternoon as the race got underway the peloton was celebrating the fact that the sun was out these are the best weather conditions that we've had so far in this year's race. Forecast for the low 20s, around about 21, 22 degrees, the expected top. A flag dropping at kilometre zero. An attack early, and this time from the Fortuneo Vital Concept team, which are regulars to try and go on the move. But it was all brought back together by the first climb, and it was Jesper Sturven out to try and defend his lead, who collected the one point on offer. The smallest climb of the day, a Category 1 climb. Break of 9 formed not too long after that, and the break of 9 have now split. Three going clear with six chases. This is Andre Grivko in the turquoise colours of Astana. Thomas de Ghent now goes through in the red and black of Lotto Suldal. And in the red and black, but on the white bike from BMC, is Greg Van Avermaet. They made their way through Mimac for the 
feed zone and they've amped the pace ever since that point on and that's where these three riders have gone clear they're nine minutes and 45 seconds ahead of the peloton but their chases are still within one minute behind them yet to get any footage of as to what is happening directly behind them and to see whether that chase is organized in amongst the chasing group, Raphael Micah is there, who's won three stages, all of them in the mountains, in his two appearances at the Tour de France. Here are the chases. This is Cyril Gute at the back of the group from AG to Le Mondial. A teammate of one of the stage favourites today, one of the local heroes, Roman Bardet, AG to Le Mondial, with a clear plan. Food on board, the instructions taken. Roman Sikar is also in that group for direct energy. Bartosz Husowski is there for Bora Argon 18. Serge Piles for Team Dimension Data. Raphael Micah for the Tinkoff squad. And rounding out that group of chasers is Florian Vachon from Fortuneo Vital Concept. Some beautiful forested areas throughout today's stage that we'll get a chance to take a look at. And this is just one prime example. The Department of Corres that they're making their way through. We spoke to a few of the journalists before the stage got underway. And we spoke to Raymond Pulidor, who has been a 14-time rider in the Tour de France. Here they are on their thoughts as to what might or could happen today. It's a stage that can break your legs. There's no flat roads. I don't see Froome, Quintana, Pino, Bardet going on the attack. I think they'll mark each other. There won't be gaps between the favourites. The fight for the yellow jersey, yeah, we, we could already see uh, a Froome or Thibaut Pinot uh, or Fabio Aru in, in, in the yellow jersey uh, today because uh, they're all so close there on, on the GC. It depends if they can dislodge uh, Peter Sagan. And, and we're going to see Alberto Contador trying to fight back in there to, to, to match Froome, Pinot and Aru and, and get that GC time back. It's the first rendezvous for the cyclists of the 103rd Tour de France. Peter Sagan can climb this terrain if the scenario of the race suits him. We can't say 100% that Peter Sagan will lose the jersey today. In fact, on the contrary, he could have the yellow jersey today. So there are the thoughts of some of the people following the race as to what to expect today. And one of the main talking topics in the lead up to today's stage has been the condition of Contador. Coming into the race, before things got underway on stage one, it was pretty clear he was a genuine contender. But with that crash that he had on stage one, you can't help but think sleep wouldn't have been good for the past few nights. He conceded a few seconds on stage two after yet another crash. And we'll learn a little bit more about Alberto Contador today because this is a difficult stage. And Raymond Pulador, who was speaking there at the start, a man who rode the tour 14 times, finished on the podium eight times, but never once wore the yellow jersey, not for a single day. And he thinks that this is a pretty tough stage. This is Ian Stanard on the front for Team Sky. Which will come as some relief to the riders from Tinkov, but Sky are already taking charge of the race. And the protection of the yellow jersey of Peter Sagan. Can he possibly hold on with the amount of climbing that they've got today? If it was any normal rider for the Flatland Spring Classics like Flanders or Paris-Roubaix or a man that we talk about as winning the green jersey, you'd say no. But we're not saying no because it's Peter Sagan. So we'll say maybe. He's always a chance, Peter Sagan. The next climb comes in around about 27 kilometres time for the leading three riders. So that will make it around about another 32 kilometres before the peloton gets there. And it's a Category 2 climb, the Côte de poussin merie And it's a relatively long climb. It's the longest climb that we've had so far this year, just short of 7 kilometres in length. It's a fairly gentle gradient, just on an average gradient of 4%. 
But the tests will begin. And there is Alberto Contador with that right arm still bandaged up. That's the side that is the most seriously injured. That was the one that he damaged on the first stage, the opening day of racing, with crash number one for Contador. He did the damage to the left side on the second stage, which was in the rain, so it wasn't quite as bad as much as that can be the case when you do crash. Number 91. He's got one of his teammates in the breakaway, Greg Van Arverman, but Richie has said that he's not going to go on the attack today. This isn't one of the days where he can start to claw back the time that he lost following the puncher on stage two. In terms of the big favourites for the overall, and Richie Port, he is in the mix. Sure, he's a second-tier favourite, but everybody is a second-tier favourite behind Froome and Quintana. And you have to put Alberto Contador very much in that now, given the injuries that he sustained on stages one on two. But Richie Port is a minute and 49 seconds behind Chris Froome, Nato Quintana, Fabio Aru, his own teammate TJ Van Garderen. Roman Bardet is also a minute and 49 seconds ahead of Richie Port. So Port's got a challenge ahead of him but he's up to the task I'm sure he said that one of the things that gave him great confidence in joining the BMC team was seeing the condition that TJ Van Garderen had throughout last year's Tour de France and knowing that he'd be working with the same coach a lot has been made to the coach at Team Sky Tim Kerrison former Australian swimming coach incidentally and going away from working with Tim Kerrison that was one of the key things that Richie Port had to consider and the coaching staff at BMC he was happy with the way they managed to get TJ Van Garder into great shape and that was a key element in his decision to going across to BMC breakaway group of three Grivko for the Astana squad De Kent for Lotto Sildal and it's Van Avermaet for BMC Racing this is Hurtarski for the Bora Argon 18 team Good to see this German team getting plenty of coverage at home as well. And yesterday's stage winner Marcel Le Kittel has played a big role in German television coming back into a live broadcast of the Tour de France. In fact, throughout the off-season, the last two years, Marcel Le Kittel and to some extent John Degenkolb have actually gone to meetings with the key executives in the big networks at German television to convince them to cover the race once again. And it's great to see that it is back on German television with their biggest public broadcaster. So that is good news. And yesterday, Marcel Kittel gave them what they were looking for. Now, the group stuck in the middle, now drifting further out to a minute and 54 seconds. The Peloton's at 11 minutes and 54 seconds behind. The front three are really thinking about their prospects of winning the stage. And the man at the front of the group, Greg Van Avermaet, is on target to collect the yellow jersey. He started the day just 18 seconds down. And he has more than a four-minute advantage on Andre Grivko from Astana. And he has almost a 15-minute, in fact, more than a 15-minute advantage on the other rider in the breakaway, Thomas de Gent. So Van Avermaet really is opening up the throttle to make the most of this breakaway. They're taking time on this group of six, but it's not as if they're disorganised. They look to be working well together. Everybody's swinging through. As I say that, Huzarski is skipping a few turns of pace at the back of the group. They're about to approach the next climb of the day. They're not too far away from hitting the bottom. They're around about seven or eight kilometres before they get to the bottom of it. Garrett Thomas finished in 15th position in this race last year and he's got a key role to play in this race this year in support of Chris Froome to see if Froome can win the race for a third time. We caught up with Garrett Thomas before the stage got underway. Here he is. Yeah, for sure. It's going to be all out attacks at the start. You know, stage up for grabs, maybe the yellow jersey change. It's going to be a certainly hard day. First bit of heat as well. And yeah, like you say, the final is uh, there's a lot of climbing as well. So it's certainly going to be a tough day. Maybe not like a true mountain stage, but uh, it'll still be a big, I think a select, select sort of 10, 15 guys, you know, sort of. And for sure, uh, a few late attacks from, you know, guys maybe, you know, fighting for that top 10 sort of position so still dangerous for GC so uh, I think a lot can happen today
We're not expecting any action from Chris Froome today. And in fact, Froome and Quintana, I suspect on a stage like this one, they'll just be marking their rivals. And particularly given they may not be in a position to fight for the stage victory, it's going to reduce their aggression even more so. Riding for Lotto Sildal and just aiming for the stage victory. Van Avent is the man in the middle. He's the best placed overall. Just 18 seconds down on the yellow jersey. And Grifko at the back, a five-time Ukrainian national time trial champion. So there's plenty of horsepower at the front. We've spoken about Thomas Digend a few times, actually, that we saw him doing a lot of work for Andre Grappel trying to set it up. And the conversation we had is, when you get a, a breakaway with Thomas Digend, you think, fantastic, I'm in a move with Thomas. They normally work. The next moment, you're thinking... It's no good being in a breakaway with Thomas again because when he gets in a move, he normally wins. But those three out in front are fairly evenly matched. If it came down to the three of them sprinting for a victory, you'd put the house on Greg Van Avermaet. But there's a lot of climbing to come before they get to the finish line in La Lorraine. Yeah, let's remember, Greg Van Avermaet may not be a sprinter, but cast your mind back to the Omloop at Newsblood at the end of February and Greg Van Avermaet beat Peter Sagan to win the race. End of a classic, end of a tough race, slight uphill drag to the finish line. But Greg is very quick and back in the day when we were teammates at Lotto, he used to lead out the sprint and he's very fast. He won the points classification at the Tour of Spain a long time ago, 2008, very early on in his career and he won a stage of the Tour de France last year in a photo finish, slightly uphill, ahead of Peter Sagan. He's super quick. So the other two will be doing their utmost to get rid of him. Now looking at these beautiful pictures, Matt, of the scenery, this is the type of thing that I never really noticed when I was riding the Tour de France. It was only afterwards that I would watch some footage and then see and realise where we were. And I always thought, must be nice to go back and visit and just cruise along on the bike and then stop in. And when it gets a bit too warm, just jump in one of those lakes or jump into one of those rivers. I even thought it during the Tour de France a few times when it's really, really hot down south. You've got those creeks bubbling alongside the road and I was suffering so bad I thought I'd just love to stop for a bit, have a dip in the water and then just lay down on the grass, have a little nana nap, a bit of an arvo snooze. But there was always a time limit they gave me to get to the finish, so I never got to actually go and do it. But it was always so appetising, always jealous of people who were in the water when I was out there racing on a hot day. It just looks so much more inviting. And look at this peloton, they're strung out in single file, and the first three, the leaders, are still going away from them. And that's the reason that you don't have much time to even take a glance at the scenery around you because you're concentrating on the wheel in front of you. These guys are really moving around 50k an hour, all strung out. So no time to look at the side because if you clip a wheel, you'll end up looking like Alberto Contador at the moment, covered in bandages. Now, I'm not saying he looked around and clipped the wheel, just lost his front wheel in that right-hand corner on day one. But you pay for it for a long time. I guess on the upside, if you crash on day one of the Tour de France, by the time it finishes in Paris, there's almost nothing left of the injuries. It's hard to tell that someone's actually been injured and had skin off. It's just a little bit pink still, but pretty much healed in the space of three weeks. But there's the fatigue in the process of trying to recover. It's interesting to see the different team tactics today. Fabio Aru, who's one of the dark horses, one of the outsiders for a spot on the podium at this year's race, he's got a teammate in the breakaway. That's Andre Grivko who's in the leading three. Contador, who we've spoken about a lot, he's won the race twice. He's got a teammate in the breakaway, Rafael Micah. Team Sky have chosen a different tactic. Leave everybody surrounding Chris Froome, which for Team Sky I think is a good move. There's no point them putting a rider in the breakaway. Yesterday we saw some great team tactics by Direct Energy. I just want to go back to yesterday's stage momentarily with Brian Cocker. He said that yesterday he was very disappointed, but now he knows he can go with the very best, so he's got some confidence. But as for their team tactics, he said he knew that Sylvain Chavanel, the most experienced guy on their team, wanted to go on the breakaway because the race went through his home village and he wanted to show himself in front of his family. But Cockar and the team meeting said, no, Sylvain, I need you. So Chavanel said, OK, you need me, I believe in you, and they worked for him to try and get the win. And Chavanel did not hesitate. That was good team tactics, completely dedicated to just one man. Across at Orica Green Edge, they had a split strategy between Michael Matthews and Simon Gerrans. What's your view on that one? Well, firstly, on direct energy, it's a, a great thing from both sides, from Brian Cocard saying, 
I have the confidence that I can win, so I don't want you to go in the breakaway. I need you with me. I'm relying on you because I have the confidence in myself. And Chavanel, the experienced rider, who can almost, if he wants in the team, say, I'm going to do what I want to do, he said, all right, I will stay with you because I have confidence in you. So it's great to see Cocard rating himself high enough to say it and then Chavanel having the confidence in him and help build his confidence even further to what I see as a great result. And had Cocard not come across and bumped into Marcel Kittel, for mine, he would have won the stage because he got in front as he hit shoulders, but then as they hit elbows, it just put him off balance and he really had no throw at the line. Compare it to his lunge for the line the day before where he held off Peter Sagan for third in Angers. He had nothing and he lost by 2.8 centimetres. And because he was so off balance after bumping with Marcel Kittel. But that's all part of it. Sometimes you really don't have it completely under control. You've got to understand that they are so deep in the red zone, he would have been sprinting hardly able to see. So you do get a bit off balance and the, you know, a bit of bump and grind is all normal in the sprint, but it did cost him. Now on the other side, Orica Green Edge, two pronged attack but it failed on both fronts. We saw Matthews doing his own thing, Impey leading out Gerrans, and now Matthew White said the idea was for Gerrans and Impey to go long, try and make it a really long, dragged out, tough sprint, but they couldn't get out. They were blocked in, so they didn't get to go early. If you've got a plan to go early, you make sure you can get out. You make sure you've got room. You've got to manoeuvre yourself into a position where maybe Impey's catching a bit more wind for longer, but make sure you can get out. You don't get closed in. In the end, Matthews tried to go in the sprint, but started to fade, and in the end, crash. So let's see what's going on here first. There is Daryl Limpy from the Orica Bike Exchange team, just collecting a fresh bidden. That's from the birthday boy, Christopher Yul Jensen. And it is the Direct Energy team that have been caught up in this little incident. Also Jasper Stovin there in the Mountains classification jersey, a couple of riders from Lampre, and one of the riders, I think, might be Robert Wagner there from Lotto NL Yombo, Arashiro there. And that was Chavanel that was involved in that fall, the man that we were just talking about. Arashiro getting the bike organised here. We wait to see whether it's Rui Costa. No, it's not Rui Costa that is with them. It's Louis Mankies. And this young South African, he is a genuine chance for a top 10 finish in this race. A genuine chance. So that's why the Lamprey riders were waiting. The leaders, it is Van Avermaet at the front, followed by Grifco and then De Ghent. Three kilometres to the sprint. One kilometre to the King of the Mountains prize. That's not fair, is it, Robbie? Ouch. Uh, I think it's just going to be a, a long draining day for the six chasers because they won't see these three riders back again. Once you let Thomas De Kent go, it takes an almighty chase to bring him back and I just don't think the firepower is there behind Greg Van Avermaet. He's rolled up the sleeves. Summer, Literally. Summer has arrived. One kilometre to the sprint. Grivko back with the team car. I wonder if Alexander Vinokurov is in the team car. Because when they went over this climb in 2011, they went the opposite direction. So down the way that they've just came up. And Vinokurov crashed out of the race that year. Jürgen Vandenbroek went off the side of the road with him and he crashed out of the race. And there's a little bit of graffiti on the corner where Alexander Vinokurov crashed and it just says, Vino, out and points to the corner. And that was the crash where he hit a large boulder and broke his pelvis. He did. I think, by memory, he walked back up to the side of the road. And then collapsed. For all the criticism, and it's justified whatever, a lot of it. Whatever you say about Vino, okay, justified, but hard as nails. He was tough. This is the intermediate sprint, and it looks as if Thomas Degent wants to collect the intermediate prize once again. And Grivko sitting at the back, thinking about the small time bonus, perhaps. Van Avermaet wants the time bonus. He's 18 seconds away from the yellow jersey. A three-second time bonus for the first rider across. Two seconds for the second rider. One second for third place. And it Every second could count for Greg Van Avermaet to get the yellow jersey by the close of play this afternoon. Van Avermaet across. Don't worry about the 20 points for Green. It's a three second time bonus that he wants the most. He's only 15 seconds away from the yellow jersey by comparison to how it listed this morning. But he's 14 minutes and 18 seconds further up the road. He's on target. I don't think he has to worry about the three seconds. It's a, it's a token thing. Think, yeah, I'm just getting some extra time. But so far in front, I don't see them losing more than 
eight minutes of that lead probably will be about halved by the time they get to the finish. I tend to agree. There's nothing to gain by, from the GC riders by chasing it down to try and really narrow it down to two or three or four minutes. They'll be looking at each other. It's the first test for the climbers and the general classification contenders. They'll be looking at each other, looking for signs. Plenty will be looking at Alberto Contador to see how well he's recovering because he said yesterday, I'm having some problems and some pain when I'm riding out of the saddle. So there'll be eyes on him, but all eyes on each other and marking each other. But one thing they will do, I think, is race very hard to the top of the final Category 3 climb. I drove down the descent on the way in here to the finish. It's about one car wide, not more. Off camber corners, two very sharp hairpins, a dodgy road surface at best. They're all going to want to start at the front to stay out of trouble and not get taken out by someone else, particularly those who don't trust their descending skills so much. 500 metres to the intermediate sprint for the chasing group of six. And Raphael Marka leads them through at the moment. In terms of that race back in the main group, the reason so adamant and agreeing with you with the amount of time that they will lose is for the Tinkoff team, now that it looks certain that Peter Sagan won't be able to defend the yellow jersey, they won't be amping the pace up at all, and they'll try and make this another relatively comfortable day for Alberto Contador. The slower it is in the main peloton, the happier Alberto Contador will be. Roman Sikar is the rider from Direct Energy that now goes through to the front. One of the teammates of Brian Cocker, who finished in second place yesterday. Former under-23 world champion Roman Sikar. And he won that title in 2009 in Mendricio, the same year that Kid Al Evans won the elite men's road race. It is warm. Cyril Gutierrez has got the jersey unzipped and he doesn't have an undershirt on. It's the first day up into the 20s. Fourth in the intermediate sprint, Serge Piles goes across to collect the points. Peter Sagan not overly concerned about the points there, just nipping a couple of points. I think he's staying behind Cavendish, I thought. So Cavendish may be taking back a point on Peter Sagan, possibly two. But uh, Peter Sagan knows his advantage comes when the race gets hilly. The, all, all the sprinters get dropped early and he just cruises on through, quite often in the breakaway. And takes another 20 points at the intermediate so no panic there from Peter Sagan. Well Brian Cocker is 70 points behind Peter Sagan in the race for the green jersey. I think it was a sprint of a bit of getting rid of some frustration proving a bit of a point. As we see here some multi-coloured agricultural art. We've got a uh, 10 tractors making up our wheels and the uh, the black hay bales wrapped up. Nice touch, black handlebar tape, black saddle Black Bidden as well. Nice matching. Dan Martin before this stage was one of the favourites. The Irishman riding for the Edix Quickstep team. So too was one of his teammates, Julian Alaphilippe. And it was his other teammate, Marcel Kittel, who won yesterday. We caught up with Dan Martin before today's stage got underway. Unfortunately for Dan, though, the prospect of the stage winner slipping through the fingers for Edix Quickstep. Here is Dan Martin the role as the next man from Team BNC and I suppose the interesting thing is and I and I actually had kind of forgotten that the owner of Team BMC Phil uh, yep. his hometown of uh, Andy Reese is in uh, Bern oh. and we go there in the last week of the race what an occasion that would be Andy is a very nice person oh, it's a problem uh, that looks I like Pino. It, was a it looked like Thibaut, Thibaut Pino, Pino. Yeah. I didn't hear it on the radio, but nope. he stopped very rapidly. I we'll have, uh, have to rely on recognition there, but I, it looked like him, his style, the way he was standing. Let's hope not, because these boys are in serious mood now. Well, I tell you what as well, Phil, uh, it's also at this part of the race going to be very difficult to get back in because this now is a question of uh, Team Movistar, which has been uh, the winner of the World Tour team, the, the World Tour over the last uh, three years, one of the dominant teams on... Ah. I think they're calling it, they're saying he yeah. crashed. But well, they haven't given us his name. See, that's the problem, Paul, now. <laughs> Even our race radio and all the mechanics are split because the peloton is split. They can't catch up the riders. Well, that's the big problem. The team cars could be an awful long way back, and that was the problem that happened to Richie Porter just a couple of days ago because there was a, a climb just before the finishing climb, and the team cars were stuck behind riders who were being dropped, and they weren't allowed to come by. They were held back by the referees. So um, that, that rider who had that mechanic, I'm pretty sure, Phil, that was uh, Thibaut Pino. He 
he's going to have to get a, oh, a, a wheel from the neutral service vehicle and try and scramble back in well we'll find out when we can they haven't called his race number is 121 they call the numbers in French of course 121 uh, but they haven't said any uh, talking again they haven't mentioned it but they're talking about those three riders are still continuing with a very hefty lead it is such a difficult running now and of course this is why the main pelton have been very protective of a uh, respectful rather of the route today after this one is over we go on to another second category mountain then we go to a third category which is actually very hard and then we come to the finishing line well we come to the finishing line with a very nasty tricky little two and a half kilometer descent with yeah. uh, a number of nasty little hairpins just back there I'm sure are plenty of the geologists who would be ha very happy to see that uh, little pui we could just spot there and the puis are basically plugs of extinct volcanoes and as you said earlier there are so many of them in this part of the world it must have been quite interesting uh, six and a half to 13 million years ago we're looking at uh Serge Powell's in the white jersey on the right side Cyril Gocho he's the man that's probably got by room in the hotel tonight which we've located this morning he's staying there this evening and also Rafael Mica, champion of Poland of uh, just over a week now and a good climber Well, again, here we go. We're looking here at Team Movistar, and it was a tough choice this year uh, because uh, they, they were looking for one of their men for the Flatlands, Alex Dowsett, and uh, unfortunately for him, it was uh, right down to the last minute. Oh, uh, Andre Grifko now in that uh, Astana jersey. He's finding this gradient just a little bit too much. This is, as I said, the steepest part of the climb, the Puy-Marie. Oh, that hurts. He's a great time trialist. He's been four times champion of the Ukraine in the individual time trial, but here... He really has paid for the effort of being uh, in this group. So as I mentioned, this is the steep part. Uh, we're looking at 11.3, 11.9, 11.9% for the final three kilometers. A little bit further back, uh, just sitting at the back end of the group all the time. And I have a feeling that the man we're looking at there, uh, Daniel Teckleheimer, he's conserving energy to uh, hopefully do something a little bit further down the road once we get into the mountains. Benavamart on the left hand side he's not one of the great climbers but I just think that the form that he's got uh, this year coming into the Tour de France uh, slipping away now uh, Fabian Cancellara riding his last Tour de France well, it looks like one or two more are in difficulty now at the back Steve Cummings 104 has gone with uh, Daniel Tekla Hymanot also Fabian Cancellara losing ground too we're getting up into the heavens up here now this is the highest point at this pass as we climb up to the top of the Puy Marie the next one that we climb is a little bit sharper but doesn't go quite as high now the problem is uh, the last three kilometers are where this climber really becomes its worst at uh, average gradients uh, averaging there between 11 and a half and 12 percent it really is uh, quite a beast of a climb then narrow roads as well and once you get over the top of this you've got a pretty tricky descent uh, down into the outskirts of the final uh, climb of the day the Col de Pertus which is ranked also at second category so goodbye Andre Grifko now these two riders left free to fly for a jersey each in the Tour de France tonight Polka Dot for De Gent yellow for Van Evermart be a first for both of them yep it will and there's a big number of riders though Phil now starting to pay the pressure of the tempo that is being dictated in the main field by Team Movistar one by one uh, plenty of riders uh, moving away just spotted uh, Ian Stannard one of the riders from Team Sky he's not one of the great climbers he's one of the riders who is expected to do the pacemaking on the flat but even now in the group in the middle a lot of riders starting to uh, get eliminated we're now down to four chases while the three leaders are a kilometer away from the two leaders are a kilometer away from the summit yeah Sikar Vashon the last two riders you saw there being dropped by that chase group uh, this just shows you the pressure here and remember this is the first time the tours encountered the, the climbs this year and their legs do strange things Tony Gallopan we fancied him today he's also being dropped from the group right now 
Well, it's just the indication. I think I just spotted Adam Hansen. Yeah, that's Adam Hansen as well, uh, slipping away. This just this is kind of a reference, Phil, uh, for us to understand how difficult and how great a job Movistar are doing. I think we're going to see a massive battle. Let's not forget, we're not even at the end of the first week of the Tour de France. There's three weeks of racing to go, and everybody said it's all about the final week. These two there just going off the back for Cannondale, Drapak and the USA as they continue to slip away here. Thomas Vukler also going backwards now, saving themselves for another day. Tom Dumoulin. Yeah, now that's a surprise. That, a lot of people were saying maybe this could be the day for Tom Dumoulin, but look at the crowd here at the top of this climb. And this to take the lead in the King of the Mountains for Thomas de Gent and there's no resistance from Greg van Avermaet. Well now Phil they've gone over the top of the climb and uh, as we've seen on the ascent up here well this is what it was like on the uh, ascent at narrow roads it's a very tricky difficult descent as we start to go down the other side with uh, one or two nasty little corners and of course bear in mind that we got reports uh, a little bit earlier on from Steve Perino who's on the motorbike yeah. that the roads are melting and we know what happens when that happens it makes it very tricky around the corners now this is serious stuff from Movistar now there's Nero Quintana himself on the left side of our picture over on the right hand side the two riders riding together the two leaders of team BMC well all of a sudden the overall leader Peter Sagan in difficulty yes these hills were too steep for Peter he's no inspiration now because he knows the yellow is off his shoulders tonight but we'll be talking about him all the way to Paris but not today well, a lot of people have uh, questioned why do you think that Peter Sagan does not know his limits in the sport? Well, over the last few years, he's bulked up quite a lot. He's become extremely powerful in the sprint. He's a punchy rider. But I always wonder in the back of my mind, Phil, if he, if he slimmed off for five or six kilos, could he actually be a Tour de France contender? But for him, I think he just enjoys his life and enjoys his racing too much. This is Nibali here. Wow. This is Nibali, the man that won the Giro d'Italia has now made it quite clear he's not trying to win and do the double here with the Tour de France. He's always said he's here to help his teammate Fabio Aru and I guess this proves a point. Well I tell you what that, that does not help uh, Fabio Aru uh, when you've got your, uh, your, your conscience uh, getting dropped on a climb like this. Uh, Fabio Aru being left alone but what it does say now Phil we are looking we are having the foundations laid for a head-to-head -head between two great teams. Team Movistar from Spain. Look at the faces on these riders from Spain now it's they're, serious they're doing everything they can to reduce that gap and what a gap it is because at the end of the day if they do something phenomenal here this afternoon it's down to seven and a half minutes Alejandro Valverde could be in the yellow jersey if they can pull it all back in the last 30 kilometers or 18 miles of the race now I kind of expected this because this is Rafael Maika the best climber of what's left of the chase he's going to try and leave these guys now and go third on the road if he can catch up with Grifko uh, and it looks there is a reaction from Serge Powells who will go downhill the other side pretty quickly if he can control Micah making the move. Micah goes over the top in fourth place. Yes, but the gap, Phil, you've got to read the clock. Uh, two and three quarter minutes is the difference between uh, these riders and the two leaders. Oh yeah, I'm not thinking he'll catch <laughs> up. I think he'll just get rid of the others, that's all. Ooh, let's go downhill. Yes, now when I talk about a technical descent, that's what the riders are lining themselves up for. Well, now all of a sudden, the man who has been uh, the animator of the opening four stages of the Tour de France, uh, here he is, uh, Peter Sagan. He has been undefeated uh, since he uh, started riding the Tour de France uh, when it comes to winning the green jersey points competition and his first Tour de France, well, that went right the way back to 2012. And ever since then, all the way through, he's been the winner on the uh, Champs-Élysées of the green jersey points competition and that's a competition that at the moment he is still leading but at the moment it looks very much as if uh, the yellow jersey is uh, being relinquished look at this this 
in fact is already putting a little bit of a signal down to Team Sky saying hey we are here for Nairo Quintana we will do everything we can but it's nice to see Richie Port you know the, everybody uh, was yeah. concerned that Richie Port would no longer be the dual leader of uh, Team BMC but for you've got to be sensible about this you know it's only the first week of the Tour de France and Richie Port yes he lost a one and three quarter minutes but all of a sudden with a ride like this today he's going to start to climb right up again in the overall classification and that's what he wants to boost his morale Richie does get a little bit affected by situations out there on the road and he has to be brought round to think positive because there's no doubt about his talent the boy from Tasmania and uh, he's gonna feel pretty strong today Frank Schleck as we just heard him on the radio just passing through our picture has now been uh, dropped from the group Kirienka's just gone for Sky oh it's hurting a lot of riders now yeah but what's maybe more important is Team Movistar are hurting Team Sky at a point like this look at this another rider from Team Sky Lander, at Mikkel Lander I'm surprised at yeah. that Paul well this this is like a psychological slap in the face from uh, Team Movistar they are proving why we've always talked about Phil we've talked about them going back to the days of Pedro Delgado Miguel Indurain as being the team for the mountains and they know that the last week of this Tour de France is all about mountains today the Tour de France has changed its face for the first time since we started the event the leaders are testing each other they're going to have to play subservient to a new leader tonight and we're seeing uh, Seppel Velder's just gone the rider was disqualified last year but he's a very talented rider and he really wasn't trying to cheat he didn't see anything wrong with the situation he's an Argentinian Sky are living with their leaders TJ Vanguard and BMC are still there it's going to be very decisive every second counts and there's two more climbs to come before we climb up to the finish thank you very much for reminding me of that that there are still two climbs to go but there's also a dodgy tricky descent there number one to oh there's a little acceleration little dig at the top here i just saw adam yates too the orica bike exchange rider look to be hanging on at the back ah. Well, sorry about the excitement there. It wasn't an acceleration. Richie Port saw somebody at the side of the road. He, more than anybody else, knows how important it is to reach to eat at times like this. In fact, uh, when he was riding for Team Sky a couple of years ago, oh, Alaphilippe also struggling here. As I mentioned a little earlier, this is the first time that the Tour de France has had heat. We're looking, we're, we're creeping up to around about 30 degrees Celsius over the top of the climb. It would be a bit cooler there. You can just see. That's uh, Adam Yates, just towards uh, the back end of the group. He's uh, starting to, to pay as well for a little bit of the, the pain in this leading group, but there's not many riders left. Heading up the mountain now, and it's Movistar has hurt so many riders in this race now. The gap is inside seven minutes, 15 miles, 24 kilometers to go. They can't catch those leaders, can they? well i'll tell you one thing phil as we go over it's all of a sudden come from 15 minutes phil around about oh, uh, 10 a... kilometers ago down yep. to seven minutes bear in mind oh just uh having a quick look over the top of the helmet there that's peter sagan you can see he's not enjoyed this mountain no. uh, one mountain too far but i mean you've got to imagine this is a he's a big guy he's almost six foot and uh, the you look at the way he's built he, he he's built like almost built like a boxer this is yeah. power we're looking at and that's the disadvantage he has he's dragging those extra pounds over the top of this mountain but it tells us how much effort this man has put in to keeping that yellow jersey he remain as popular as ever first four riders behind those two leaders Mike has been joined by three others after the climb well just to throw a few stats in there Phil you know I normally always work on that uh, one kilometer for 10 kilo one one minute yep. for 10 kilometers well in uh, 14 kilometers there the main field slashed uh, four minutes off the advantage of uh, the two leaders so it could really go down to the final climb of the day we could see a, a massive big uh, turnaround and though four minutes would mean they'd lose by 256 <laughs> <laughs> Nibali here he's just cruising yeah. down this descent I wonder if there's a story here Nibali dropping from that group a very select group of around 25 26 riders here the brakes Tony Martin he's a good descender 
He's also, but he was looking over his shoulder, so I wonder if he was uh, just checking to see if he had uh, one of his teammates in difficulty who needed pacing back. Now this is a, a little bit more interesting as we look at the speeds now. We're starting to get, as the road straightens out, look at that. Craig Van Avermaet, 42 miles an hour, he did just a few moments ago. So we're getting into the tricky part of the descent where you can, you've got to, you've got to back off your brakes. They'll love to see that. 20 kilometers to go. At 14 kilometers to go, they'll be at the top of the next col, the Col de Pertuis. And then we move on to the last climb and the finish. So the two leaders, they now know that they've got to one more climb. And it is a, and it's a nasty little climb. In fact, they've got two climbs. The last one, uh, the Col de Fond de Serre, that's uh, around about three kilometres long and an average of uh, five and a half percent. And, and although it uh, is only given a six to six and a half percent to driving up it in the car, I thought it was a much more difficult climb than that. This is uh, the penultimate climb that they will line themselves up for, the uh, Col de Pertuis. And that's a climb of uh, around about uh, four and a half kilometres, uh, average gradient, eight percent. But again, as they get up towards the top it's 11 percent and that's where the team of the climbers team movistar will have the advantage uh, here is the profile as you can see uh, Mondai. Uh, that's where they start and they start to climb up the black sections are sections in excess of 10 percent and as you can see just to make it a little more difficult the uh, big long black section is right towards the top of the climb The four men in no man's land, uh, the last time check we got to, to them was uh, around about three minutes behind the two leaders. De Gent doing a great operation here this afternoon. He's got himself uh, a lot of points in the King of the Mountains competition. Now here is the start of the next climb of the day. The penultimate climb for these riders, the Col de Pertus. Contador has rejoined the main group, which has stretched to about 27 uh, uh, riders now. But he looks the way he's steering his bike down the mountains. He's suffering from the pain on his right side. Remember, in two days, he fell twice on that same side of his body. And let's hope he's OK. These are the four chasers now. In front, there are three riders in groups of two and one. As far as I know, Griffco is lost in no man's land. We've run out of cameras now to show you all the pictures. Listen to the crowd. Well, this climb, Phil, when you start to look at the uh, average gradient, is uh, very nasty indeed. And it's the last two kilometres when it starts to really leap up to 10 and 11 percent. And it was in that steep gradient on the previous climb that the two leaders lost huge chunks of time to Team Movistar. It's a long time since we've commentated on two Belgian cyclists in the front of a stage of the Tour de France. I don't mean that in any disrespectful way. Eddie Merck spoiled it for the Belgian folk when he dominated the Tour de France, winning it five times. And then we had the great climbing prowess of Lucien Van Impe. And now we've got two riders up front, and they're looking good to stay away for the day. Yeah, I just had uh, Jens uh, Voigt uh, pop in there, Phil, to uh, just to remind me. Yeah, I saw I, him. What did he I say? Always, tell well, me, tell I, me. I always talk about the, the one kilometre for the one minute for 10 kilometres on the flat. But he said on a day like today, after a hard stage when these guys are starting to tire, they can look to lose a minute per kilometre on the climb. So it's really going to be dodgy. A while back we said these guys are going to win. It's all done and dusted. But when you look at the speed, when we get a chance to go back and see Team well, Movistar a little later. Your formula works they'll be <laughs> caught and dropped by six minutes well, that could be this <laughs> it all depends on how much firepower Movistar have got left or, or, or who they're trying to damage I mean they might they might not be unhappy if these two dominate the day for a couple of days they want to close the gap though yeah, but then it becomes complicated because their leader, even though their leader for the Tour de France is Nairo Quintana, the man every rider on Movistar respects is Alejandro Valverde. He said that he's just going to help Quintana do as best as he can in this race. But for Valverde, there's a chance of a stage victory today. It's an ideal stage victory for Alejandro Valverde. And let's not forget, uh, the other day when we went up towards uh, Cherbourg at the end of stage two, he was looking for the victory. He's got the forms. 
so he would obviously be looking for a stage victory in the early part of the Tour de France and why not a little bonus of a yellow jersey as well Alaphilippe well uh, he's in that next group at uh, three and he is at six minutes and 50 seconds he is uh, the best place rider in the overall standings uh, in that group because Peter Sagan has been left behind but he only has a two second advantage over Alejandro Valverde Movistar going for it well look at this Paul this is like a sprint finish on the top of a mountain because Movistar are having none of this Sky's getting in amongst it TJ Van Garden's BMC team are here this is absolutely fantastic bike racing and they're just trying to hurt each other as well as reduce that lead by Greg Van Avermaet well this is a day when we expected to see a little bit of separation between some of the major contenders but I think that this day is doing a bit of serious damage because that team Movistar Phil they first of all they've have started to come out to say we are the team that are going to challenge Sky this is what it you've got to put your seatbelt on going down a descent like this because this gives you an indication we're looking at speeds 45 miles an hour down here but I'm just thinking about Movistar as we look a little bit further towards the back of this group yes they have come here to look after their man uh, Nairo Quintana but the man who uh, has been the lead of that team for years is Alejandro Valverde and he's probably thinking one minute for every kilometer I could win the stage and the jersey well it's that is uh, De Gent doing all of the climbing Van Evermart is not the climber he's a strong cyclist but not the climber and just to prove me totally wrong he's just attacked can you believe that he's gonna test the Gent here and try and go he's, he's he needs to get away I suppose he feels that way if he gets to the top of the climb De Gent will still lead in the mountains but there's still one smaller climb to come before the finish well no love lost between the two Belgians well I did tell you Phil that uh, coming into this race uh, we're looking at a man who broke his collarbone in the Tour of Flanders earlier in the year watch this move here he could feel at this point you know you, you have an instinct sometime as a professional rider that you feel the moments to attack he knows there's 17 kilometers 10 miles to go to the finish and now he's made his move and he attacked in front of the home flag of Flanders there that black line on a yellow background now it's up to Thomas de Gent he'll have to take a few risks on the way down we've got some very very dodgy descents to come here for now Vermont, as I was just starting to say before he attacked Phil he had that uh, accident in the Tour of Flanders in April he broke his collarbone but he's fought back he had great form in the national championships where really he helped his teammate Philippe Gilbert to win a second title but that gave me the indication he was coming into the Tour de France on the top of his form and this kind of course today if you're in great form and even if you're not a, a magical climber you can use your power to survive on these kind of slopes future but you know he's in his first Tour de France and he must be wondering I beat these guys every week when I ride now I'm in the Tour de France they're putting me under this sort of pressure it's a very very different bike race you mentioned it's his first Tour de France Phil it's also uh, I think his first Grand Tour as well his first yes. Grand Tour participation yep. he's learning by jumping into the deep end and he's proving he's a champion because he's hurting and he's hanging you know, funny. Contador on the back there Paul you see him dancing around on those pedals there that the Tinkoff team he's hurting there's Dan Martin over on the left hand side in the uh, blue and black jersey of Etix Quickstep uh, what a changed rider he seems to be now that he switched across to this team Etix Quickstep which we've always regarded as being one of the top teams in the world Daniel Moreno is the rider from Movistar at the back he's been working hard but now he's been put back in his place there having a quick shower alongside him with Adam Yates as well Orica bike exchange this is the maximum gradient 11 percent for this ride oh it's hurting but he he's just gonna see yellow look the gap is just come inside six minutes there's only nine miles left to ride 15 kilometers and here he comes now he could have the double here as he's building more points maximum points over the top five for him well it now looks like they're starting to pull back riders uh, one at a time that's Roman Sicard just over on the left hand side in the black and yellow jersey he was in that early group of nine riders and isn't it funny how a few moments ago it looked as if Movistar were all in control but now once it's come to the crucial part of this stage they've mustered the troops for Team Sky and they are now dominating the pacemaking behind the leader
Well, it's very hard trying to do calculations as well as commentate on the Tour de France when it's uh, a split like this. But if the next sprint, the next climb is won also by De Ghent, I think he'd be equal on points uh, by uh, Avermaet. He'd be equal on points with De Ghent, and in effect, because he's won the last climb of the day, he would lead the King of the Mountains as well as have yellow. Well, I think for him, more importantly, is the yellow jersey. As again, you can see, these roads are really quite treacherous. You've got to be very careful as he picks his way around that corner. 15 to go for Micah and uh, the uh, Huzarski. Two Polish riders here. And Huzarski's hurting a bit. This is the tough man. Three times ridden in the Tour de France. One time the King of the Mountains. Three times a stage winner. Well, the speed that that gap was starting to come down that seems to have switched off. It uh, really got slashed down to the uh, six-minute margin. Now it seems to have stabilised out again. And I think that's because Team Sky have said, OK, well, we're quite happy with the situation. They'd be quite happy to allow a guy like Greg Van Avermaet to have a four- or five-minute lead in the overall standings. But just watch the way he goes down this descent. He's reading the corners as he goes into them. Oh, it's coming up to a good corner there, but our cameras, of which we have no control, has gone back to Micah on the way up. And he really is hurting his countryman here, but he's hanging in, Bartosz Zatsky. I think uh, the fact that they're not closing in now, they've made their play, they've weakened a lot of stars in that back group, but the big stars like TJ Van Garden, Chris Froome, Fabio Aru, and uh, of course Contador is still there too. Well, Mikel Nievi is the rider on the front for Team Sky, followed by uh, the rider from Wales, Geraint Thomas, uh, with his jersey wide open there in third position. Little Enau in second wheel. <laughs> We're picking them back. This is Vashon coming from the breakaway. Oh, those legs, he's just about going to make the top here. It's going to be a long ride home, even if it is only seven miles. Yeah, Sergio is now looking well, very comfortable as uh, Rafael Maika. He's also uh, picking up a few points, Phil, in these high-ranked uh, second category, King of the Mountains, yep. back with the lone leader now. Now, this man, Greg van Avermaet, will be starting to dream not only about a stage victory, but more importantly, about something that sometimes might even be a little bit more important than the stage victory, and that, of course, is the maillot jaune, the yellow jersey. Well, that's what made this Tour de France such a good one. I doubt he attacked today ever dreaming of yellow, but I might be wrong, but I don't think so. He's never worn yellow before. He abandoned uh, last year on stage 16, having won one stage of the race, out sprinting Peter Sagan at Rodez up a hill. And the hill actually is a bit steeper than our finishing climb today, but there's been a few more on this route. Nieve. Sitting on the front, uh, and now over on the left is uh, Roman Bardet, the rider from AG2R. He's just riding in front of Dan Martin. This would have been a, a great stage for Dan Martin if they hadn't had this early breakaway that got clear and built up a 15-minute advantage as uh, the group of the main contenders now summit the uh, the real final climb of the, the the penultimate climb of the day, the Col de Pertus. And, and actually, funnily enough, uh, when they come up to this last climb of the day, I keep forgetting all about it because it's uh, almost like a mountain top finisher. But it is the Col de Fond de Serre, and and I think uh, as we drove up this morning it's a pretty nasty little climb we drop down uh, into the valley the valley that takes um, these riders uh, all the way uh, down towards the south tomorrow because uh, tomorrow we start to race down to uh, Monte Limar and on tomorrow's uh, uh, I meant actually Montauban as we head down uh, tomorrow we move away from uh, Arpajon for uh, again a stage that should be a stage for the sprinter. This is the main road now that he drops onto. He ride along here for uh, three or four kilometres, then take a left-hand turn and start that final climb of the day. And Team Sky, well, they're just uh, inheriting the responsibility of pacemaking. 
looking at the riders on the full-on descent the descending pull down to that t-junction we drove past this morning where we turned left onto the highway 122 beautiful smooth tarmac highway and then left and they go up the third category stepping stone to the finish very very narrow road yes i always wonder sometimes uh, how they do uh, at the tour de france decide to categorize some of these climbs because uh, i thought that final climb of the day the, the nasty little summit up to the the col de fond de Cer, i thought it was a very difficult climb and it's almost like a mountain top finish because once you go over the top of the climb it's two kilometers right the way down into the town here uh, and then all of a sudden it is uh, on the finishing line meters to climb he's going faster and faster he, he feels the magnet of the Mayo Jean that's why he's riding now like two men there's a Belgian flag from Flanders as he goes by yeah the Vlaams Alu the Lion of Flanders and it seemed to have inspired him here just a little bit further he gets out of the saddle and kicks because he knows Phil pretty much once he's gone over the top of this climb he doesn't have to find very much more energy downhill he'll be touching speeds approaching 40 miles an hour and it's really only uphill for the final four or five hundred meters he's one kilometer to go to the summit here for Thomas de Kent they're both in the final kilometre. Well, they're not anymore because over the top is Thomas de Kent. Maximum points. It's only two points here, but still, it's all important at the end of the day. And I think uh, de Kent goes over in second. I think they're equal on points in the King of the Mountains now. Uh, de Kent will wear the polka dot jersey because uh, the yellow will be on the shoulders of Van Evermatt, whatever happens. Five kilometres to go for this very select chase group. Well, Team Sky, I think, are setting a pace which is not a pace to rip everybody apart, but just to keep a little bit of pressure on. But they do know, and they've all talked about, the final descent of the day. Locked onto the wheel, AF Pill, that locked onto the wheel of Chris Froome was Nairo Quintana. We will see many more battles. But look at this descent. This gives oh, us this a chance bad. to see what is waiting for the main field. Now, it's not important for this man we're looking at, for Navamart. He can take his time going around these corners. But if one of the main leaders has a little... Whoa, look at this. Oh, the adverse. Camber. Now this is the problem, Phil, for the main contenders because if uh, Chris Froome or Nairo Quintana or any of the other big leaders of the Tour de France has a problem here, they'll lose time on the finish line. See how narrow the roads are now. We drove down this and we remarked on it at the time. If you don't make the right turn at one kilometre to go, then you go straight in for the full-on barbecue. I suppose the big advantage that the main contenders have had is most of them actually came across. This is one of the stages that they came out uh, and did a reconnaissance on. They will know this descent. And I, and I have to wonder why the organization, after such a brilliant day of racing today, found such a sketchy descent inside of the last two kilometers. Sometimes difficult to get to the finishing line any other way. That's the, that's the tricky turn. Keeps on going round, and there's the kilometer. Oh, quite amazing, Phil, there. When you looked at his face, all of a sudden there, it was as if the pain was wiped away and the smile finally appeared. But another of the heroes of the day, you've got to admit, is this man, Thomas de Kent, who at the end of the day uh, will be crossing the line in second place. But if it hadn't been for his power in this breakaway, the breakaway wouldn't have built up a quarter of an hour. <laughs> Bardet here, Bardet, Bardet rather, Bardet. who's gone. He lives in Clermont Ferrand. He's more or less the local boy, and he said he was going to try to do it. Quintana's latched on to his third, third wheel. Valverde's got him. Seconds can be won and lost. Chris Froome has got to wake up, and TJ. Pino has got onto the back of the group as well. Alejandro Valverde is steer steering at Nairo Quintana into a very interesting position. Every time you've got a chance of getting some Here moments. Comes the sky. Well, Sky are making the move, uh, but I'm looking to see, and it's not the shape of Chris Froome. He's on the back foot at the moment. It's been a very tough day. And it was a very, very horrible descent, and that's still to come here. This could be very dangerous for the race as they come down to that one kilometre sign. And this is a great move by Movistar, and it's put 
Contador in trouble. Number 31 there, uh, Alberto Contador. He just can't get out of the saddle anymore, Phil. He's nursing himself around this race and he's going to lose time at the end of the day. He's riding lopsided on the bike. He is struggling with that injured shoulder, which is on the right side. Movistar, Contador's just gone over the top and this is not the descent for nervous people. Quickly there, that was uh, Rafael Maika. They are uh, further up on the road, but this is a very cheeky little move there by uh, Alejandro. Alejandro Valverde and the man in second position would go back to the second place finisher on the stage, Thomas de Gent. Thomas de Gent, second place for him on today's stage. A 1-2 for Belgium, two different teams. They've had a wonderful day out. Yes, he would have loved to have won, but hey, second place is pretty good. Brilliant ride by him, uh, he lost a good chunk of time over the last few moments but that's not really important when you're crossing the line in second place. Well done Thomas de Ken, but more importantly, what is going to happen on the descent? We've seen the little acceleration coming here and uh, Nairo Quintana said before the start of the Tour de France, any day, any stage is a stage where I want to grab a few seconds here or there. Well, this looks like Grifco now drifting back here. The peloton is speeding down on this very, very nasty stretch of road. Well, they need to pay attention because it is a very tricky, technical and narrow descent through the forest. And I tell you, it makes it much more difficult when you're in and out of sunshine like this. You, and the man who really saved a Chris Froome there was Sergio Anayo, the rider from yep. uh, Colombia and Team Sky. He never panicked, but he dragged Chris Froome back into contention. Well, one after another now, they are in a desperate trouble here at the moment. So number 107 here is Serge Powers. He was in that breakaway. Still, it looks like Valverde come forward here and he's not going to give up uh, right until the very line. They're inside the final kilometre. Look at the way Valverde looks over his shoulder just to make yeah. sure that Nairo Quintana is on his wheel. This is a great thing to see a former brilliant, well he's still a great champion but he's working for his mates and they're putting time into Contador. Well, Contador is coming back after that descent. He's got the right turn coming up and remember he'll lose seconds if he doesn't get onto the back of this line of riders. Valverde has come to this Tour de France to guide Nairo Quintana to victory and that's exactly what he's doing today. He put Froome in on the defensive but Froome has come back as has TJ Van Garderen. As has Richie Porte over on the right hand side. TJ Van Garderen is on the left hand side. This is Rafael Maika coming up towards the line and a great uh, tip of the hat to, to Huzarski. A very good ride by Huzarski. That's an outstanding ride for the Bora rider but it's the Polish champion who will take third at least I think he's third because we can't keep up with what everybody is but I think it's third for Micah and so that's some consolation for Tinkoff who've lost the race lead today with Peter Sagan former king of the mountains and a three-time stage winner third today for him what a terrific day of racing. Hudzarski better go for it because they're right on him and Micah better watch out at 150 meters to go well, that's Dan Martin who's leading them home in there the from the Etix quick step in the blue, and he's just ahead. It looks like Ala Philippe has recovered. Martin gets in, Ala Philippe just behind. So Ala Philippe's going to keep his young rider's jersey. Now there is a gap here, and there is Contador. I think he'll lose three no. or four seconds. Now that was Kurtziger. That was Kurtziger at the back coming across oh, the line. Still coming. Contador is further down the road. And these gaps will all be separate times. Once the gap of a second, they change the clock. So he's losing time, but what a fighter he is, Paul. He won't give up, but you have to wonder how long he can nurse his oh, injured body through sorry. these next few stages. What a great ride by Alberto Contador today. I don't think he's telling us the truth about his injuries. I think he's really suffering. But he's in, and he only conceded a few seconds. Well, that was Matthias Frank coming in there as well. Well, this is Serge Powell who went straight through the group and is now bringing up the rear. Look at the time on the clock. Well, we will have a new leader in the Tour de France tonight. His name will be Belgian. He's from Lokeren. 
and is Greg van Avermaet. A great victory by him, two and a half minutes ahead of another Belgian, Thomas de Kent. And the Belgians will climb to the top positions in the overall standings on time and in the King of the Mountains as well. So the mountains of Contal have had a good story to tell on the Tour de France today, and we're only stage five. From second to tenth, but not from first to second. Five minutes and 11 seconds now, the buffer for Greg Van Avman, then Valverde, Rodriguez, Froome, Barguil, Quintana, Uru, Roland, and Martin. All those riders are separated by just six seconds between the lot of them from second down to tenth place. So it's tied amongst the men that we think can win the final yellow jersey. For those of you in New Zealand watching, we've just seen, I've just seen George Bennett go across the line. Young Kiwi from Nelson who's riding for the Lotto NL Jumbo team, who I think will be a little bit disappointed with his performance today. Yesterday, the tour got its first taste of the mountains, and today the journey south continues towards the Pyrenees. But this setting off from Upper Jean Chaussee is a day where the peloton won't get to enjoy the scenery. There's simply too much at stake. It is a day for the sprinters. Hello, and welcome to stage six of the Tour de France. This is Matthew Keenan with you. Upper Jean. Jean Soussaire is the host of the start of the stage. It's just to the west of La Lorraine where we finished yesterday. It's still in the massive centrale. It will provide stunning pictures throughout the day as they descend down towards Montauban for the finish of this stage. So this is what confronts them on stage six, heading out from Upper Jean Soussaire, destination Montauban. It's 190.5 kilometres and the stage is majority downhill. It starts at just on 700 metres above altitude, finishes at 150. There's a few climbs along the way, category three and category four intermediate sprints, but it is one for the fast men. The signing of the cross from Greg Van Avermaet in yellow. He's got the handlebar tape in yellow, the helmet as well. Crowning moment in his career for now, but I think there's a lot more still to come for Greg Van Avermaet. Flag going in to get racing started. Two riders getting off the front. Yukia Adashiro in the pink and blue colours from Lamprey and Jan Barta in the black colours from Bora Argon 18. And this is the third time that we've seen Jan Barta get himself into a break. He's very much having an impact. Three minutes and 36 seconds the advantage for these two riders. 136 kilometres left to race. The main peloton being controlled by three of the teams of the big sprinters who are the favourites to win the day. Edex Quickstep in support of Marcel Kittel. Dimension Data in support of Mark Cavendish. And across at Lotto Sildal, they're doing the job to hope that Andre Greipel can reverse the photo finish of a few days ago. <laughs> It's been a good race for Bora Argon 18. They've been well represented in all the breakaways so far. They had one of their riders in the break yesterday. That was Husarski that managed to get into the move. We've seen Paul Voss in the King of the Mountains jersey. Jan Barter has been the most active of the lot of them. They've more than justified their wildcard invitation. As Daniel Teklahamanot is doing the job at the front, the Eritrean national champion. Tony Martin comes up alongside his teammate, Julian Fomont, and provides him with a fresh water bottle because it is Julian who's been doing the lion's share of the chasing for Edex Quickstep throughout the first week of racing. Down through the Lot Valley in the uh, department of the Avignon. This valley runs for some 485 kilometres and it certainly is a beautiful part of the world. Looks like a nice spot to get out in a kayak. A few opportunities there for some whitewater rafting, but not too rough. All smiles, Tony Martin. Warmest conditions that we've seen so far throughout this year's race. Forecast top of 32 degrees. There's Marcel Kittel, the first of the riders in the blue colours from Edex Quickstep.
and they are just about to approach the first of today's climbs. This is a Category 3 climb. The Côte d'Escat, which is a two-kilometre climb with a 6% gradient. And back in the main peloton, they'll be doing their best to make sure they don't take too much time off the two leaders. They want to leave them out there so as nobody else is tempted to try and attack. All 198 riders still in the race. And given the damage done to Contador, Bennett and Morkov after their Stage 1 crashes, that's an impressive feat. This is the first time that the Tour has kept all the riders that started the race intact at the beginning of Stage 6 since the year 2000. So although we've seen quite a few crashes, by comparison to recent history, it's not quite as bad as what it has been. Lars back in the red colours for Lotto Sudal. Marcus Burkhardt is the first of the riders from BMC and this is working out well for them. They've got the yellow jersey but they don't have to do any work to defend the jersey. We're in the yellow house holds the record with 34. He's jointly on 28 with Bernard Hino and they've both been full of praise. And encouraging Mark Cavendish to go for more. Not that Cavendish needs a whole lot of encouragement. This is Nardo Quintana on the far side. Riding alongside Danny Marino, one of the new recruits to the Movistar team this year. Across from Katusha, where he spent a long time with his close friend and he was the super domestic for Joaquin Rodriguez. But it's not an unfamiliar environment for Danny Marino. The earlier part of his career was spent with the Movistar team. Well, that was with a different sponsor then, Case de Pan, the Spanish bank. It's now their big telecommunications provider. And the team is most famously remembered for its period known as Bednesto, when the great Spaniard Miguel Indurain won the Tour de France five times in succession from 91 through to 95. Here at Train National Champion Tekla Harmanotz is riding alongside the very experienced Austrian Bernard Eisel. Mark Cavendish was delighted to have Bernard Eisel back in the race with him yesterday saying that he was the one that you could always rely on to do the calculations in the Gruppetto to make sure that you made it inside the time delay. Top of the climb, Jan Barta looks as if he wants to collect the points. He just pushes his nose ever so slightly forward. He's been in a few breakaways, Jan Barta. And this is the first time he collects points in the race for the polka dot jersey. He gets two for going over the top of that one in first place. Adeshiro collects the one. But still a long way off the lead in that classification where it's Thomas de Gent who leads. He's on 13 points. And yesterday Thomas de Gent actually ignored team orders. He was told not to sprint for the King of the Mountains points. And focus on the stage win. But he wanted that jersey. And today he'll be working for that man, Andre Greipel. Froome could not look more relaxed. Ian Stannard is the man that he rides alongside. A small testing of the legs yesterday for Chris Froome, courtesy of the Movistar team. Tomorrow is another rendezvous with the mountains. It's not a mountaintop finish tomorrow. They go over the cold ass spam and then have a quick descent down through to the finish line in Lec de Peol. And it's a slightly shorter stage tomorrow. It will be the shortest stage that we've had so far. Not the shortest for the race, but the shortest so far at 162 kilometres. And shorter stages always entice more aggressive racing. Lars back nursing the peloton up this Category 3 climb. Idyllic conditions for the spectators. There's barely a breath of wind. Stunning, stunning conditions. Certainly for those on the He's the leader of the King of the Mountains classification, Thomas de Gens, who was also second on the stage yesterday. 
was quite the ride by Thomas De Gent yesterday and he put out a very nice tweet afterwards don't want to brag but I was able to stay for 200 kilometers with Greg Van Avermaet today the strongest one I thought that was a nice statement from Thomas De Gent about yesterday's stage winner and it was Thomas De Gent who initiated yesterday's breakaway and as I mentioned before the team told him not to go for the King of the Mountains jersey but Thomas said he defied the orders because it was to realize a childhood dream to be the leader of one of the classifications at the Tour de France it's his first time doing so at any of the Grand Tours that was Alex Howes loaded up for the Canada Drapak team making his way across the top of the climb couple of questions coming in via Twitter one of them from Artie Hardwick asking the question as to whether he's the only one that has noticed that Joaquin Rodriguez is so well positioned in the overall standings I think part of the strategy Artie for Joaquin Rodriguez is that nobody notices he's just going through this very smartly and very quietly at this stage I thought coming into this race that Rodriguez would be targeting stage victories but after his performance yesterday as he's moved up into the uh, top five overall into fourth position in the overall standings he's on equal terms with Chris Froome in fact three seconds ahead of Chris Froome Rodriguez might be hoping to get onto the podium for the second time in his career I don't think he's a threat to win the race but he can certainly finish inside the top three and things have been going well for him so far Jan Barta and Yukia Adashiro, the two riders at the front of the race. For the Lamprey team, they've had a slight change of strategy as to who their team leader is. Coming into the race, the man that got the number one on his back is Rui Costa. And rightly so. He's won stages here before and he was crowned the world champion in 2013. But he conceded a big chunk of time yesterday. More than eight minutes on the other big favourites for overall honours. So they're now focusing on Louis Menkes to be their man for the overall standings, whilst Rui Costa will be trying to win a stage. Incidentally, when uh, Rui Costa won that world title in wet conditions in Florence in 2013, Louis Menkes went on to take the silver medal in the under-23 race. He rode the Tour de France last year, Louis, but he abandoned the race with illness towards the back end of the race. It was early in the third week that he abandoned the race. They mentioned Data or MTMQ Becker that he was riding with at that point. They had plenty of faith in him. They allowed him to then prepare for the Tour of Spain, where he finished in 10th place. Very good sign for the future, that result. Yeah, open pit that we're now getting a chance to take a look at. The landscape has been pretty heavily marked around this part of the world as a result of the various mining that went on with millions of tonnes of coal extracted from here. It was also the site of a very famous strike, a strike that lasted by the miners for 66 days. They went to the bottom of the mine and they stayed there from the 23rd of December 1961 through to the 26th of February 1962. So right through Christmas and New Year's celebration and there was 1,500 of them that remained at the bottom of the mine for that period, striking for what they thought should be fairer conditions. That is a big way to make a statement. I'm not sure whether they got exactly what they wanted. Two leaders about to hit the next climb of the day and it is a Category 4 climb this time around. The Côte d'Aubin is the next one. Pretty short climb at just 1.3 kilometres in length. Adeshiro at the front, who has been a winner on uh, French soil in the past. He was the winner of the Tour Limousine some four years ago. And a top ten finisher in the road race at the World Championships in 2010. That was in Geelong, down in Australia. Had the opportunity to be on the ground for that race and see him go across the line in a big bunch sprint finish that was taken out by Tor Hushov.
Alberto, he surely he can't bounce back after the time losses and the injuries and win the race, but he's not surrendering. He is adamant that he will make an impact. Five minutes and 22 seconds now the advantage for our two leaders, Jan Barta and Yukia Adeshiro, the two men at the front. When the race finished in Montalban in 1998, the only other time that it has finished here, the breakaway did manage to survive, but it had a much bigger contingent off the front. It was a group of around about eight riders. Andrea Taffi, the great Italian, who was a winner of Paru Bay, was amongst them. And uh, Luca Iona, who's one of the key rider agents of Finnish cyclists, now a rider agent, he was also in the group. But the day was won by the charismatic Frenchman, Jackie Deron. Well, the breakaway been given some freedom. The sprinter teams, they think they've got things under control. And I'm joined by one of the great sprinters of his generation. Robbie McEwen steps into the commentary box. He doesn't bring his three green jerseys with him because it's warm enough today just to wear the one T-shirt, Robbie. A warm day as the race continues to go south towards the Pyrenees, which makes this an important day for the sprinters. Afternoon, Matt. Well, any day that's a chance is an important day for the sprinters. And I just heard you talking about the 98 Tour, the finish here in Montalbon, and it was very warm that day too. Jackie Durand beat countryman Laurent Desbien at the finish. And it was one of those days you were just glad it was over. It was long, it was hot, it was draining. The roads were really rough too on the rundown. It didn't take exactly the same direction as this. But talking of the sprinters, they'll be very keen to be racing for the win today, not only because of the prestige of a win, of course, but they know there's a whole lot of suffering to come before they'll get another chance. Because from tomorrow onwards, we're in the Pyrenees to get a rest day in Andorra. And the next chance, and a slim one, I think, is on the stage to Revel next week. So they'll be giving it everything and the teammate of this man on the front, this is Lars Back, his teammate Andre Greipel, the German champion. Well, he'll have everything crossed that everything goes right, that he can do a full sprint and jag a stage win to step up there with Kittel, with Cav, with Sagan, so that all the big names have a stage win so far in this tour. Kittel, Greipel and Cavendish are equal physically. Slightly different attributes, but equal physically. Getting it right, team support can be crucial. Fabian Cancellara on the far left-hand side of the screen. And we just had the question via Twitter from Jamie Narragon asking whether we think that Fabian Cancellara will abandon the race to prepare for the Olympic Games. I'm not so sure because the back end of the race goes into Switzerland. And the final rest today, rest day is in Bern in the Swiss capital. So I'm absolutely convinced that Fabian Cancellara will be riding right the way through to there, which is almost at the end of the race. So I think he'll go all the way through to Paris in his last Tour de France. They're I my think, thoughts anyway. I think he'll go all the way too, although it would be just a really short, easy trip home from after the stage in Bern and the rest days there. So he could just go home and stay home. That's a rest day for you. Sharing the points. Category 4 climb this time, and it's Arashiro who will go over the top in first position. This is the Cote d'Aubin. One point to the tally of Yukia Arashiro in the race for the King of the Mountains jersey, which today has been held by Thomas de Ghent after his big escapade in the breakaway yesterday. But yes, Matt, bad jokes aside, I agree with you. I don't think Cancellara is going to go home early. I think he will finish the tour. Yesterday, Thomas de Ghent told us that he ignored team instructions. They told him not to sprint for the King of the Mountains prize, to save everything and put it into the basket for the stage victory. And he said, well, I've won a stage in a Grand Tour, but I've never worn a leader's jersey, and I want that polka dot jersey. And he went and got it. Good move. And Thomas de Ghent is renowned for his stubbornness because a few years ago he was riding for Vacanzole and they got a start in the tour. So they said to Thomas, great, we're riding the tour, you're riding the tour. He said, oh no, I can't and I won't. We've been planning for nine or ten months now to get married myself and my fiance and it's on the first Saturday when the tour is scheduled to start so I'm sorry but I can't be there and I won't be there and when he gets something in his head he just does it and as a yesterday's a good example of that don't do the mountain sprints he does the mountain sprints although 
in in fairness the first one he did a couple of hard pedal strokes looked around there was no challenge they said okay they're letting me have these the rest was just being a part of the breakaway didn't really have to sprint that hard to get them so you know disobeying team orders and sort of a uh, half and half he didn't have to sprint so nothing against him getting them and now he's in polka dots and i think he probably thought to himself too fanavamart's got me covered uphill and i'd like to get something out of this i don't think getting those mountain points it was the difference between him challenging Van Avermaet and getting dropped. Definitely not, but the question has to be asked, how many cyclists organise their wedding in July? It's like a football fan organising their wedding on grand final day. Breakaway group of two, Arashiro at the back for the Lamprey squad, new team for Arashiro this year. He adds another point to his tally in the race for the King of the Mountains jersey. He spent most of his career riding with the Direct Energy team, although the sponsor was Europe Car, and he became, along with Beppu, the first Japanese rider to finish the Tour de France some seven years ago. But Merida, they want to make an impact in the Japanese market, obviously, so they've got themselves Arashiro, who... He's not just on that team because of that Japanese connection and the bike sale option. He's a class bike rider. He's on there because he's good. He's been top 10 at the World Championships and a winner of the Tour Limousine. And along... The rest of the bunch, they know they're just going to roll in, not lose time, wait for tomorrow, the big mountain stage. But again, there's always that fight on these flat stages towards the end. It's not just the sprinters and their teams, but the riders of the general classification and their teammates trying to keep them in front, avoid any little splits in the peloton and a loss of time. It makes it really very dangerous at the front of the bunch with basically everybody trying to be in the first 20 positions. And of course, it doesn't work, 20 positions into 120 guys. It's a really big game of musical chairs and the music stops and there's not enough chairs for everybody. They are talking at the UCI about extending the three kilometre rule as we know it now. So if you have a crash or a puncture, you get the same time as the bunch. They're talking about extending that out to five kilometres now. So I'm hoping that, for the riders sake, does come through and gets approved. It will stop some of the, the nervousness, I think, to a certain extent, at least on the, the easier finishes. But still, the problem is, that splits can occur even within the last kilometre and you could end up losing 10 seconds while you know, running 40th in a bunch sprint you could still lose a lot of time. And just to note that that ruling only applies to flat stages not mountain stages. King of the Mountains jersey on the shoulders of Thomas De Gent. he's got the bike and that was ready and waiting for him. He's on 13 points in the race for the King of the Mountains jersey. In second position is yesterday's stage winner, the overall race leader, Greg Van Avermaet. He's on 11 points. Jesper Sturven is in third position on five points. So there's three Belgians at the top of the table in the race for the King of the Mountains jersey. Jan Barta and Yukia Adeshiro, the two riders off the front. Robbie, back to that conversation that's been had a lot in the last few days about safety in the final few kilometres. What can be done to try and make it better? Less chance of crashes. Sir Dave Brailsford, the manager across at Team Sky, was asked the question, and his response was pretty short and blunt. Fighting for position goes with the territory. It's a bike race. Grow up, everybody. It's a very simple way to put it. But... And I, I would have no problem with that as a, as a rider, say, yeah, some can do it, some can't, but I think on flat stages where nobody's realistically going to lose any time coming into the finish, I'd like to see a sort of three kilometre to go time check. But the problem with that is, on the other side, that if guys know, oh, I can't lose any time once I get inside three kilometres, and I get, 3k to go you start get guys just sitting up pulling out to the side or splitting the peloton almost on purpose and you get guys coming in like brown's cows and it also doesn't look very good you want to see everybody racing for the finish line so i get why they are hesitant and hesitant to do something like that as well so that's answer of dale dave brailsford is the easy one just get over it and get on with it yep well, Brailsford is in a position where they've got such a strong team to support Chris Froome, they're not as affected by it as some others. You look like you're deep in thought, Robbie. I wonder what he'd say 
if a sprinter, for instance, said Froome was in my way, so I just dropped the shoulder into him a bit. Oh, sorry, I didn't mean to make him crash and break his collarbone and he's out of the tour. Oh, well, Dave, like you said, grow up. <laughs> Get used to it. This is Marcus Burkhardt on the front for BMC. Things working out perfectly for the team today. There's a lot of former stars on the race that continue to work, Robbie. People like Stephen Roach and Sean Kelly. And I have seen both of those. Sean Kelly we see in commentary and Stephen Roach working with Skoda here on the tour with VIPs. Had a good chat to him the other day. Still enjoying being here in France. 95 kilometres still to race. Back of the peloton with number 39, Michael Valgren. One of the riders eligible for the white jersey of best young rider, but not targeting that because he's supporting both Peter Sagan and Alberto Contador. Also saw at the back there momentarily, Cyril Gutierrez, number 46 from AG to R Le Mondial, who was in the breakaway yesterday, and he made no excuses. He said, I just wasn't strong enough. When De Ghent, Van Avermaet and Grifko went off the front, we just didn't have the legs to close it down to them. Good, honest appraisal of his performance yesterday, Cyril Gutierrez. You can't disparage him for that sort of a assessment of how things went. Yeah, less than ideal. That turned out for Gutierrez all day in the break, and then not only getting caught, but having a crash as well. Or crashing, then getting caught. Got another Twitter question here, Matt, and I'll let you answer this. Do you think that the sport of cycling will be better or worse off next year without Oleg Tinkoff? worse off agreed and the reason why i think the sport will be worse off because he says some stupid things and he's not necessarily somebody that i would want to have close in my life to be perfectly honest but he challenges and he pushes the envelope sometimes he goes over the line but he challenges the race organizers he challenges the governing body the uci and his intention is actually always good he's trying to improve the sport and he's a colourful character. I think the sport will be worse off for the loss of Oleg Tinkov. You? Yeah, I think the sport will be a lot worse off, especially because it's a team that employs a lot of people. That's the number one reason. There's all the other things. He's quite entertaining Did you to have as part of the cycling fraternity. You see any of the footage of him watching at the finish line on stage two when Peter Sagan won? I haven't seen it. Okay. Well, you can't repeat any of what he said, but he gave everybody around him directions as to where to go. And it certainly wasn't PG. He was pretty happy with the win for Peter Sagan. Oh, well, that's typical Oleg as well. But you just, you take the good with the bad, but whatever he does, right or wrong, whether you agree with it or not, it is entertaining. It is. And he puts a lot of money, or has put a lot of money into cycling over the last few years. Started with a pro continental team, named after himself. Then he was behind the setting up of the Katusha team originally, was ousted. It was a bit of a coup going on there, and it's uh, not unusual in Russian sport. Did you have any dealings with him when you were with the Katusha team? I did. He was the man who brought me to the team in the first place. He was setting up the team, and he offered me a contract to go and ride for Katusha, which I accepted. And only a month after that, he was gone from the operation, which I, I found quite puzzling but uh, there you go he was gone but he he said I will come back to cycling and a man of his word he came back set up his own team um, not without controversy taking over the the Reese owned Saxo team now tink off again and as soon as he's got it all up and running with some of the best in the world including probably the best I think his worth what he brings to it for a sponsor having Peter Sagan on the team. And as soon as he's got all that set up, as he leaves again. It's a bit of a shame. It is a shame. This is Peter Vakok who's now on the front. We haven't seen too much of him yet. Rider from the Czech Republic. He's in his first Tour de France. But they've got confidence in him, rightly so, this team. They've got him contracted until 2017. Putting forward, who happens to be his coach, said, Tebow doesn't cope with the heat. This race is only going to get hotter. He's in trouble if he doesn't cope with the heat. If that's what it was, he will be in big trouble because temperatures are starting to soar down here in the south and we're about to start the Pyrenean stages. And we know once you get into the Pyrenees, it's not uncommon to have 35 and 40 degree days, hot enough to start melting the road, in fact. Almost starts to just pull the riders' tyres down into the tarmac as it softens up under the hot sun. 
And today they're already starting to feel that already in this part of France. Gets up to around even 28 degrees. On the road itself, the temperature's a lot higher. They, we talk about track temperature or court temperature in motor racing or tennis, and it's the same in cycling. The heat radiates back up off the black road surface. So a 30 degree day, in fact, when you're that close to the road like the riders are, it feels like it's already above 40. Still the Lotto Sildale team, along with Edix Quickstep and Dimension Data, doing what they can at the front just to contain that breakaway of two. Although it's classified as a flat stage, it still rolls along not super easy. One of the big favourites for the stage today, Andre Greipel. He's had a near miss, particularly that photo finish behind Mark Cavendish on stage three when he thought he had won. But it was never a convincing celebration. He'll be hoping to make a real one today because it's a very long wait until the next realistic chance on the stage to Ravel, which will be next week after the rest day. Rest day, well the first one, is in Andorra this year after the Pyrenean stages. Out of Andorra, downhill out of the Pyrenees and across the flatlands towards Ravel, heading north. Again, it'll be a very hot day again. But uh, the sprinters, a lot of suffering to do between now and then. But they're not thinking about that at the moment. Think about one thing, getting to the line first. So you see a couple of riders just bunny hop the island. So that a couple of days ago, just around a kilometre and a half from the finish on the stage that Marcel Kittel won, there's a real bottleneck coming into a roundabout and it was Dylan Grunewegen, the Dutch champion, who did a nice little bunny hop right through the middle, threaded through the road signage as well as he bunny hopped over the island, kept himself in position and had a really good run to the line, which makes me think he has got the form to possibly jag a stage win in this race. And he's got the bike handling skills. He's not going to be pushed around at all. Marcus Burkhardt drifting back for BMC to have a chat by the looks of it with Richie Port. Richie Port and TJ Van Garder, and at this point they've still got joint leadership between the two of them, despite the fact Richie Port is a minute and 45 seconds behind TJ Van Garderen. The building was interrupted by the Black Plague of 1348 and also the beginning of the 100 year war, but has certainly survived the journey of time. And a picturesque little square out in front of it. Crowds never cease to amaze at the Tour de France. They just get a glimpse of the race itself. But it's such a carnival atmosphere beforehand with the publicity caravan that goes through first and then at the back all the team cars coming by and the anticipation that builds in a town like this when the helicopters start to arrive overhead. Predominantly French flag flags on the side of the road today. And they'll be playing against Germany tonight in Euro 16. And there was a nice little clip taken by Andre Greipel on the Lotto Sildale team bus this morning as Tony Gallopin, one of his teammates, was listening to the French national anthem whilst watching something on his phone. And Andre Greipel made the comment that Tony looks pretty confident about tonight's match. So their teammates today, they'll be rivals in the hotel tonight. Jasper Sturvin down towards the uh, back of the peloton for Trek Segafredo. It's still Tekla Hamanot who's riding at the front. Multiple individual time trial champion of Eritrea. That comes as no surprise. But also he's been the time trial champion of Africa. And there's some song, strong time trialists in Africa. Now one of them that was born and raised in Africa now races under a British licence. And that, of course, is Chris Froome. And if he turned up to the African Championships, he would take some serious beating, obviously. The best young rider, this is Julian Alaphilippe, who said that yesterday was a missed opportunity. 
Seventh on the stage yesterday, Alaphilou. He said that the team is here just to support Marcel Kittel and they'd ridden to protect Marcel Kittel the day before when he won. They'll be riding today to protect Marcel Kittel. So they couldn't really ride in support of Julian Alaphilippe yesterday. He's not as bankable yet as Marcel Kittel. So they've got to make those strategic decisions as to when they spend their energy. Today is the ideal day to do it for Marcel Kittel. There's no standout favourite for today's stage. I think it's even peggings between Kittel, Cavendish and Greipel. And certainly for the French, the sentimental favourite is Brian Cocard. This looks like the Church of Margot once again that we're going to get a chance to take a look at. Or is this another one a little bit further on down no, the road? This is a, a different chateau to that of, of the Chateau de la Reine Margot. This is a, a different chateau completely and a... This is an abbey by the looks of it, the old abbey of uh, the Luc Day. The abbey de Luc du. And it was at this abbey in 1940 that the Mona Lisa was moved to, along with more than a thousand other paintings from the Louvre, to be put in storage for safety at the outbreak of the war. So it played a significant role in protecting some of the great artwork of not just of France, but of the world. Well, I was going to say, it looks a lot more fortified than the other chateau that we saw, and indeed its name is the Fortified Abbey of Loc Dieu. Dieu being French for God. In place, it'll be encouraging as much as it is frustrating. Now, Matt, just going to do a quick shout out here for at KellyCat12, that's Belle, and she'd like to say, and I'd like to say happy birthday to her mum. She hasn't said what her mum's name is, but happy birthday, mum. There you go. Incidentally, shares a birthday with Eric Sabel, the German who is the record holder as far as green jersey wins go in the Tour de France with six. But you've got three. It's not six. It's still three. Still more than most. It is quite the record. The uh, Chateau de Nejac. With its big view perched on the top of the town. And according to history in this region, it was built to actually intimidate the local population when this country fell into the French kingdom. And it was the brother of King Louis the Ninth that actually built this. And they started building it in 1100. It was uh, purchased for just 12 francs during the French Le Revolution and for a little while became a quarry and was then abandoned. It's since been saved and the local municipality are trying to keep it in its current condition and not let it fall into any further state of disrepair. So when you say it became a quarry, it seems they were just pinching it a brick at a time and calling yes. that a quarry. They were. That's lazy, a quality. Lazy man's quarry. It is the easy option. Richie Port with the the gold necklace uh, dangling in there I just think that Richie Port despite the mechanical problem that he had has still got a very good chance of a high finish in the Tour de France this year and I actually spoke with uh, one of the uh, coaches of uh, team BMC Alan Piper the Australian before the start of this race and he said yeah well Richie gets a bad rap for never holding three weeks together but this year he's had the ideal preparation and the confidence of his team so therefore he's going to be good The beauty of the Dex department, the Tarn et Garonne, as the riders continue on their way here. 46 seconds, I think they're going to close in, Paul, because uh, we heard Mark Cavendish tell us earlier, the last 25 k's are narrow and quite dangerous, and he reckons there's going to be a race to that point, and so these guys will have to be brought back. 
Yes, I think they will. But, you know, I think the teams of the sprinters, Phil, have got so much firepower uh, in them there this afternoon that once we get over this plateau down to the flat part with about 25 to 30 kilometres to go, I think they've got the firepower to pre prevent any last-minute attacks going off the front end. And that's why they're quite happy now to pull back those two leaders because uh, you can see as well just how difficult to the, the race has been because you can see a long line of riders appearing at the back. And when Tommy Vokler comes to the front like this, you, you look at the way he's bound is his shoulders are bouncing there he's really dishing out a little bit of pain 43 seconds it's got to be shut down soon now the scenery is changing dramatically here as we start to race down towards our final kilometers to the finish and the crowd are not low in voice for these two Nasty sign there though, Phil, though, once you see the red car going forward, the yellow car going forward, the yellow car is the neutral service vehicle, Mavic have sponsored this, uh, this service for many, many years, as Barta accelerates there to try and get himself uh, just a couple more points here over the top of the climb, they're moving out, the referee's red car is moving out as well, and that's a sign to the riders in the breakaway group that the writing's on the wall, it's not going to be very long before they get caught by the front end of the peloton. Uh, and I think this isn't a attack not for the top of the hill I think he's tried to go alone he hasn't eased up at all I think Barta wants to try and be the last man standing well if it was an attack it's not really been a very successful one either because uh, you could see the reaction coming from Arashiro and uh, look at this it, it really is it's a magnificent valley here and although we are coming uh, pretty much into the department of the Tarn et Garonne the river Tarn itself a famous uh, river the Garonne another famous river we're now looking down on one of the other rivers of the region that of course is uh, the Aveyron just down there and uh, talk about uh, geological foundations it really is a magnificent gorges these gorges eroded over the years because of the passage of the river further down the climb now it's still Thomas Vokler on the front for direct energy and he uh, just uh, has a quick look across there now most of these riders will never take a drink uh, from somebody at the side of the road they might take on board a bottle of water and spray themselves but in this day and age of uh, doping controls and uh, all of the other things that uh, might happen they would not they won't take the risk nowadays of taking a drink from an unknown person at the side of the road so Thomas Vokler there in fact uh, taking on board a drink from one of his team helpers who just happened to have on the same jersey to remind Vokler to take it on board well I'm pretty sure he didn't actually uh, ride his uh, bicycle up to the top there but uh, now as we see that game of chess going on <laughs> it really it's going to be a little bit of a game of chess on the running down yep. towards the finish to make sure you have the right pawns in the position before the king takes over I just want to know what gear they were using <laughs> uh, they've got a fabulous view watching the helicopter comes right around here so you can see the road right below them there it is which side do you think they came up Paul <laughs> mm. well there we go I'm sure they didn't uh, scale the uh, the rock face there because that would have been a rather technical ascent brings a new a new uh, angle to mountain biking doesn't it well they've come back together a Bart has lifted the pace for sure but Arishiro says we're going down together and he's gonna wait he's gone back up to him the two of them just got with the referee car and the motos there now they've taken out the service cars as they'll have put uh, in the yellow jerseys there that yellow shirts a service moto which will carry wheels for these two now it is out from the finish now uh, team sky are still helping uh, chris through they're changing partners at the front looks like ian stanard might be dropping away from the front now job done for the day direct energy still controlling peter sagan remember is in the green jersey tucked away in a very good position well actually i think this is an error by direct energy they're on the front too far out from the finish uh, you haven't seen yet uh, etix quickstick come forward mm. for marcel kittle they're waiting biding their time there you know you now start to see a team that does have firepower in the red jerseys lotto sudal right in the middle there in that white jersey is andre greipel bear in mind he is the sprinter looking this year to over open up his account that's why he's going to be uh, a little bit keener to have his team now start to assume control well the wise old owl uh, Sylvan Chavanel that got to the front of the boys in black and I think backed them off there 
Yeah. Be luck and also coming through. Dylan Grunewagen is up here. Don't forget, Phil, when we spoke to Etix Quickstep before the start today, they said, we're going to bide our time. We're going to wait. At the moment, I can't see them. There's a black jersey to the bottom on the right-hand side there. They're waiting for the time to take control. The best way to win this is to have four men in the last one and a half kilometres at the front, and then with 500 metres to go, just two riders left, and you launch your sprinter into the attack. Alexander Christoph is down there as well. I can also see Michael Matthews trying to mix in with for the Orica bike exchange squad. Everybody using up the pacemakers as we're running out of kilometers, just over two to the line now. And it looks as though Lotto Jumbo in those yellow jerseys are trying to get Grunwagen to the line. Shoulders are now touching. You've got the big Marcel Seberg coming up through the middle. He's the rider with the red jersey and the black helmet, but everybody is looking over, waiting for someone else to look comes up through the middle it looks very much as if there's nice control here for Lotto Jumbe Grunewagen the uh, jam champion of Holland is in the middle there in the red white and blue but still no sign of Etix Quickstep still no sign of dimension data no this is quite serious now one and a half kilometer here comes Quickstep rushing up on the outside trying to bring Kittle into a position they're coming at one and a half kilometers to go uh, Grunewagen has dropped back into fifth or sixth place that red top to his jersey he's a very quick finisher and it's his teammate who's setting the pace of the front. This is the penultimate roundabout. There's another one, a nasty little roundabout that the riders have to take on the left-hand side, just inside of the final kilometre. Katusha now are trying to wind it up. You see this excessive speed now stretches it out into a longer line. That makes it a little bit safer for the sprinters. All the guys who are thinking, I've got a chance of winning in the sprint today, are left behind. One kilometre to go. The Manx missile just has scored another direct hit. Number Number 29 over the years that he's been coming here, it looked as if he was boxed in, Phil. It looked as if he got it all wrong, but he bided his time. He waited. He waited for Marcel Kittel to open up the sprint. But, you know, that really is the sprint of Mark Cavendish of old. Once he opened it up, he still had the firepower to come through. He's beaten some big boys to the line there. Uh, Alexander Kristoff, not far away. Uh, Rikesi was the man who led out for Etix Quickstep down towards the end. But this is the moment it done. That's a Rikesi there who's slipping away on the left hand side. Marcel Kittel is right in the middle, perfectly launched by his teammates. But look at this coming up down through the outside. That was a pretty amazing move by the rider from Fortuneo, who in fact got That's himself up there. Dan McClay Dan gets McClay. himself, uh, I think, looking at the photo there. Well, difficult from this point. Second or third place for Dan McClay. A big win, big move by Mark Cavendish, though absolutely huge result for the young British rider there we'll wait for confirmation of whether he's finished second or third but he was right in the mix today Daniel McClay in his first Tour de France looking down here on the rugby stadium in Montauban because that's the big sport in this part of France take a look at this enough time to look across uh, but what a great performance there by McClay well uh, the Kiwis are claiming him in fact uh, I believe he was born in New Zealand but he was raised in Great Britain but he's certainly turning out to be one of the top sprinters on the block here for the uh, little known team there's initial confirmation Kittle McClay and uh, that was a very good sprint because if you look behind him and we'll get a chance to look behind uh, Dan McClay in a few moments time there are a lot of very good sprinters and we get a chance down here to look at France's second pink city have a look at this there is uh, Christoph on the left uh, Peter Sagan in the middle in the green uh, but watch the acceleration from uh, Mark Cavendish uh, this really is the Mark Cavendish of old but coming back quick 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 on the right hand side there is Dan McClay the Dutch national champion inside of the top 10 too but back down into that aerodynamic position uh, three stage victories now for Mark Cavendish number 29 since he started participating in the Tour de France now he he is outright second best stage winner of the Tour de France behind a certain gentleman from Belgium by the name of Eddie Merckx, the greatest cyclist of all time.
Here we go then, there's the confirmation. Cavendish gets the victory ahead of Kittle. Uh, McClay in third, Christoph Laporte of Kofidis, Peter Sagan in sixth place, Grunewagen turns Coca, and uh, another Kiwi getting up there as well. Uh, as we can see, uh, Shane Archibald uh, from uh, New Zealand and Bora Argen popping inside of the top ten. And that will put Mark Cavendish back into the green jersey as the leader of the points classification. No photo required this time for Cavendish.